success? And will the streak continue? A big debate about big numbers. Where and why should Facebook, Google, or Amazon pay taxes? And how much? French President Emmanuel Macron is proposing a new tax to help boost the European Union's budget. In our big picture, we take a look at the issue of taxation in the digital economy. And coming up in our third hour, we are launching our very first executive talk. This new weekly segment takes a closer look at the business and opinion leaders of Switzerland and what makes them tick. We start off with one of the most successful and at the same time controversial Swiss managers of the recent past, Josef Ackermann. And we ask him about the greediness of some bankers leading up to the financial crisis. But yes, I think we were uh, too short-term driven. Uh, and uh, that was one of, the, one of the issues that, you know, you created, generated volume, got a good compensation and then a few years later, you have discovered that some of these deals were actually bad deals and, and, and were backfiring. Good evening, you're watching The Swiss Pulse. I'm Ana Maria Montero and welcome to The Living Markets. The SMI closed in the green today and all those details coming right up. that close up at the markets coming up in just a few moments. First, we're going to have a look at those headlines making news here in Switzerland and around the world. Andy Rees, a Swiss businessman who owned the BMC racing cycling team and Young Boy Soccer Club, has died at age 75. His death comes with the Young Boys close to winning its first Swiss league title in 32 years. Rees's brother, Hans Willi, is also an owner of the club and the Stade de Suisse in Bern, known locally as Wangtorf. The stadium states the World Cup final in 1954. As BMC owner, Reese secured a Tour de France title five years after his previous team was involved in a doping scandal. Andy Reese's biggest achievement as an entrepreneur is co-founding the hearing aid company Fonac, today's Sonova. Sonova is one of the world's leaders in this industry. In a statement, Robert Spudi, chairman of Sonova, said that Sonova has not only lost a great friend with tremendous foresight, and an extraordinarily creative spirit, but also a multi-talented and passionate entrepreneur who left a distinctive mark. Meanwhile, it seems Switzerland is paying more and more to stay healthy. The Federal Statistical Office reports that just over 80 billion Swiss francs were spent in 2016, a nearly 4% increase over the previous year. Similar increases can be expected in the next two years, according to the COF Swiss Economic Institute. The forecast attributes this growth rate to political measures and rising salaries. Meanwhile, private health spending is also on the rise, with health-related costs accounting for 15% of household budgets versus 10% in 1993. Takeda has offered to buy drug maker Shire for $60 billion. That's according to Reuters. This would officially kick off what would be one of the biggest corporate takeovers ever by a Japanese company. The ideal would give the deal would give Takeda, Japan's biggest drug maker, a broader global reach and a key treatments that are in the late stages of testing. The possible offer comes after Shire agreed on Monday to sell its cancer unit to Francis Servier for $2.4 billion. Shire's shares listed in London surged as much as 7.6% after the report. Takeda has so far declined to comment. And the world's debt pile has ballooned to a record $164 trillion, a trend that could make it harder for countries to respond to the next recession and pay off debt if financing conditions tighten, the IMF said. Global public and private debt swelled to 225% of global GDP in 2016. The global debt burden clouded the IMF's otherwise upbeat outlook on the world economy, which is in its strongest upswing since 2011. Speaking earlier today, IMF head Christine Lagarde addressed the annual spring meeting of the IMF 
and the World Bank Group and cautioned that an escalation of trade wars poses a real threat to the world economy. We'll have much more on that for you a little bit later in the program. But first up, your weather forecast. CNN Money Switzerland weather. We start with the webcam of the day. Here is an overview of the values recorded in the last hours. And now the map of Swiss warnings. Let's have a look to the forecast for this afternoon. And for tomorrow. Here is an overview for the next days in German-speaking Switzerland. In Western Switzerland. south of the Alps. Thanks for following us. Welcome back to the Living Markets. This is the Swiss Pulse, and we are going to talk about the markets exactly now. Let's just jump right into that. We're going to take a quick look at the global markets. In Asia, markets ended mostly in the green, lifted by strong oil and commodity prices. Meanwhile, here in Europe, a little mixed, a little up in the UK, in France, Germany a little down. Meanwhile, in the US, trading is still underway, but the major indexes are currently trading in the red. Now, coming back home to Switzerland, the benchmark SMI finished today very slightly in the green. But as we'll see, things are not all bad. They're actually pretty good. First quarter earnings season is in full swing, with heavyweight blue chips Novartis, ABB, Nestle, and Sulcer all releasing their results today. So let's take it step by step and kick off with Novartis. So the Basel-based pharma giant reported strong results for the first three months, with net income jumping by 12%. This was mainly thanks to strong growth in its heart failure drug, Entresto. First quarter net profit rose to 2.03 billion U.S. dollars, while net sales rose 4% to more than 12 billion U.S. dollars. Novartis shares, however, are down a little bit today, 1.93, a little in the red. However, better news for ABB. Now, they reported their best start to the year since 2015. So apparently... The Swiss engineering company's turnaround plan seems to be working. It reported a net profit of 572 million US dollars in the first quarter, thanks to double digit incoming orders and strong sales. Now, revenue rose 10% to nearly 9 billion US dollars, beating expectations. And ABB shares ended the day plus 4.5% in the green. Very good day for ABB. We're going to take a next step now, we're going to move on to the world's biggest food company, Nestle. Now, this group confirmed its full-year guidance after organic sales growth accelerated to 2.8% in the first three months. This was lifted by improving volumes. And, well, the maker of Kit Kat chocolate bars and Maggie Soups also confirmed it expected restructuring costs of around 700 million Swiss francs this year. It seems that the strategy of new CEO Mark Schneider to innovate with new healthy and fresh food products is paying off. And the share price was up 0.2% to 1%, excuse me, also, of course, in the green. And now, last but not least, we're going to have a look at Sulcer, also making a lot of news in the last couple of weeks. The Swiss pump maker confirmed its positive outlook for this year today. Order intake from its core oil and gas business jumped by 27% compared to the same period last year. However, the winter tour-based company said it expects a one-off hit of some 10 million Swiss francs from the business disruptions regarding the main Russian shareholder, Viktor Vexelberg, when we were slapped with U.S. sanctions. Now, Salter shares, which are listed on the SPI index, were up 
2.94% today. So this also leads us to our first guest tonight, Alistair McKay. He's the Director of Investment Management at Fern Wealth. Alistair, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Evening. Thanks for having us again. <laughs> Always a pleasure. All right. Always a pleasure to, to have you sit at the table with us and talk about all of these. We'll start it with all of these results. A lot of um, companies reporting today. I mean, let's look at it. ABB, for example. Wow, right? Yes. Uh, I, I think it's worth noting that there's, um, with uh, all these companies just being mentioned, mm. uh, changes at the top in the recent years um, have... Uh, uh, seen a, a while for the companies to absorb these changes, structural uh, rebalancing of uh, product bases, um, and that's okay. taken a while for the markets to absorb. It's taken a while. These turnarounds never happen quickly. Yeah. A little bit like the oil tanker analogy. It takes a while for that oil tanker to turn around. Yeah. Uh, ABB have um, managed to reorganise themselves a little bit. Mm. Um, the market like what they see, mm. um, and they've performed well. Um, I think as far as the, the structural business is you, concerned... You seem though, concerned, though. Are you, are you optimistic? I, I, don't, I don't sense a lot of optimism here. <laughs> all right, there's a smile. Let's see what's I, uh, <laughs> I think in all of the instances here, um, the, the Swiss markets and many of these Swiss companies, they have a, a real dependence, uh, intrinsic dependence, on the Swiss franc currency. A lot of the business is yeah. done overseas. Sure. And there is that question mark that, that hangs over many of the, the operations as to how the Swiss franc's going to perform. Right. The FTSE, very much similar uh, beast in so much as many of those companies derive their, their uh, income stream from outside the country. So that is yeah. always a consideration, maybe not necessarily a concern. Okay. All right. Well, if I mean, if we look at them, they're all from different sectors. We've got ABB, we've got Nestle, Solcer, for example, you know, the ones we mentioned yes. earlier. I mean, what is their common denominator? Well, Behind we, the success, I mean. Yeah. Yes, I, I think um, share, share price reaction has maybe been muted um, this year across the board in equities anyway, yeah. as the global equity traders and investors become a little bit more accustomed to the, um, the volatility that's moved back into the market. Right. So maybe some of the reactions that we are seeing today in these shares aren't as much as we would have seen in years gone by, even last year for that matter. Um, so I think um, ABB specifically, I think that's good. I think when we look at, say, Nestle, mm -hmm. um, they uh, are refocusing a little bit as well with their, also, where their yeah. product range, mm -hmm. um, and they're moving into waters, a particularly important area, we think, in the long term. Um, and again, reorganisation of the company. Um, I think um, Solza because of the oil market, um, it's obviously feeling the benefits of higher oil prices there, and I guess a bit more enthusiasm as far as the, uh, the commodity sector is concerned. Um, and we haven't seen the, the prevalence of the Saudis wanting to drive that price down as much, but with the uncertainties that are hang over Russia and the sanctions, not just with their own uh, member, but others in that area too, it does have quite a big question mark hanging over the area. And what about Tom's, uh, Tom's, Trump's tax reform? <clears throat> Do you think... Is this also a result? Are we finally feeling the effects of this? We, we, we've seen the effects of this um, most clearly being represented in technology sector. I think uh, the pharmaceutical sector has also... There are a number of driving factors that are going on there, and I think uh, today's news flow about Shire Pharmaceuticals and the takeover, potential mm -hmm. takeover, by Takeda is a, a replication of this. Novartis have also stated that they're in the market still for acquisitions up to $10 billion. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more M&A activity in that area and the tax, tax reforms in America will give many of the, the US companies a bit more flexibility on what they can do and okay. it should ensure that we see a continuation of mergers and acquisitions in that arena. All right, if we go back a minute to the share prices, we're talking a little bit about the equity prices. So ABB up, Novartis down. I mean, what is your feeling? Do you think investors were surprised? <laughs> um, I think, again... Did they I, expect I, more, maybe, as you were saying? Or? Yeah, I think we've seen a, a slightly dampened enthusiasm in this reporting sector. Yeah. I know that the, the Swiss market's a bit smaller. If we look, broaden it out more globally, S&P 500, which is a much bigger sector, mm. if we use that as a, a sort of barometer of expectations and market reactions, mm. um, I think we've seen that that investors and traders are looking for quite a lot from these companies and they're a little bit more easily disappointed or there's a lack of enthusiasm in comparison to yesteryears. And we are maybe just beginning to see the expectations dampen down a little bit as, as, as we fear about uh, continuation of this. Well, so we're not seeing a necessarily a relief rally. That would be a bit of an exaggeration is what I'm getting. No, I think um, if, if we look at the broader markets and you touched on... on, on 
Trump's tax reforms and the way that the markets have been. We obviously saw a, a big correction uh, at the tail end of January, beginning of February. Mm -hmm. I think it's taken the markets a little while to absorb that and take that on board. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of confusion brought to the, to the table by the political, mm -hmm. geopolitical confusion and uh, chaos that's materializing. And I think as time ticks on, the market and the, 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 the investment community are beginning to take on board that when Trump sends out a tweet, it's right. to his internal voting populace as opposed to more the global community and his, uh, necessarily his, his bargaining position. So you think that these, uh, po these potential, as you say, uh, geopolitical risks, are they high? I mean, are you concerned? Um, I, I think it's dampening down, and the reason is that we're becoming more accustomed to it. It's taken us a little while to become accustomed <laughs> we're, we're to... We're accustomed to the midnight tweets, and et cetera, what, yeah. I, I think if you look at, at Twitter, everybody is waiting for, for President Trump's first tweet of the day yeah. to see where the land lies. And yeah. I think it's worth noting when, when we looked at, say, um, trade wars with, with uh, um, China, um, the tweets changed... He changed his mentality within a 15-minute time frame. When it came to uh, a couple of weeks later mm -hmm. uh, and we were looking at uh, drugs, he changed his mindset within a few hours. So the timeline's at least being stretched somewhat. Markets aren't reacting quite as aggressively as they were. We're very much of the opinion that when you look behind the, the, the in, instant chaos and you look further, as it were, take a right. step back and look at the bigger picture. It's Many companies are still managing to perform well. Yeah. Um, there is going to be a benefit as far as cash flow is concerned from the, the tax reforms, yeah. um, and that will emanate on. The European arena, the European Central Bank, still remains pretty firmly focused mm -hmm. on its strategy, uh, looking at reducing the quantitative easing and then ultimately looking to raise rates. And that's obviously a central bank that has confidence in the market. So. It is still moving in the right direction. Companies, are, corporate data is still good, economic data is still good. Mm -hmm. It's just the, the instant short-term confusion that we're seeing, frothiness, if you will. Yes, the chaos, the first uh, layer of chaos you have to get through in order to really... Yeah. Um, of course, now it, to finish up, you know, it's the, the meetings, the spring meetings at the IMF. And uh, mm -hmm. Christine Lagarde, for example, seems to be feeling positive about the growth but still very concerned about the debt and these, these yeah. crazy trillion, numbers in the trillions. What yeah. is your feeling? Well, rightly so. Um, there's been a lot of debt created in order for the central banks to, to prop up equity markets, bond markets as well. Mm -hmm. I think as far as uh, the interest rates are concerned uh, yeah. globally, that maybe took um, a bit of a, a dampener earlier on in the week when we saw inflation figures come in a little bit lower than expected. Mm -hmm. And that maybe just eases back expectations on rate rises. Um, and I think as far as growth is concerned, and, and Christine Lagarde was pointing to, yes, mm -hmm. there is the big issue that needs to be tackled in due course about reducing this debt and ultimately unwinding it. Do you feel it that all. it's like a long-term issue? Very much a long-term okay, issue. Okay, it's not, not a short that's... it's not a short-term concern. Is it more a long-term <clears throat> concern? No, I think it's in fairness it's the IMF's job to to point these things out um, <laughs> and and I think we're all conscious of them. Okay. Um, and I don't think it really changes our our mentality as far as the markets are concerned in the short term. Um, it is an issue that will need to be tackled, but right here right, right. now it's not, not, it's not something that's going to prevent the markets from ultimately regaining that momentum and ultimately heading higher. And do you think we'll see a repeat of these quarter one results? I think the, the, the think companies... Do you think a trend for the rest of the year, do you think? Or? I, I think companies have performed pretty well so far to date that, that we've seen. Um, here in Switzerland, broadly speaking so far, early yeah. days. In the US as well, I think companies have come in quite well. Um, and I think I, I expect that to be maintained over the course of this reporting season. Great. Alistair, thank you so much for your insights. Lovely to have you. Thanks for having me. Okay, much more to come here on The Living Markets. But first, here's a look at those foreign exchange rates brought to you by Swissquote.
Who are the men and women in charge of Swiss companies, institutions and organizations? What drives those business leaders? What challenges do they face? What makes them tick? Join me once a week for an up close and personal look at the CEOs, chairmen and chairwomen of this country. The Executive Talk, only on CNN Money Switzerland. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need whenever, wherever you need it. On our website, cnnmoney.ch or on your favorite social media platform. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. News programs are usually full of short stories that hardly go beneath the surface. We give you the big picture. Every weekday evening at 7 p.m., the big picture goes deeper, looking at an issue from different angles and bringing you the guests who take time to speak, explain and elaborate. Our viewers get a deeper understanding of the day's issues and the context that underlies them. The big picture, weekdays from 7 to 8 p.m. you make sure you're feeling good. We'll be focusing on all the tools available to us today to make sure we're physically and mentally healthy. From monitoring and avoiding disease to reactive and preventative health care. In particular, we'll be delving into the latest innovation coming out of Switzerland to ensure a long and healthy life. Feeling good with Amanda Kane on CNN Money Switzerland. I've spent all of my career in the field, and I think that informs who I want to talk to, but more importantly, who wants to and who accepts to talk to me. And I hope that what I bring to the table is a rigorous search for the truth and a rigorous determination and an effort to hold power accountable. Amman Paul. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. CNN Money Switzerland is designed to flow through information. Our network provides a unique take on live, worldwide financial news. We are not your common news outlet. Instead, we act as a global catalyst of interconnected information. Our live studio provides you with a detailed and sharp analysis, predicting what is yet to come. From the heart of Europe, Watch CNN Money Switzerland. For somebody to, to tell you their story, it's, it's something I All right, welcome back to The Living Markets. At the spring meetings of the IMF held in Washington this week, the economic outlook, though positive, was clouded by warnings around looming trade war threats and the level of global debt which the IMF says is worse now than before the financial crisis. Earlier, I spoke with Larry Hathaway, chief economist of GAM, and asked him about his main takeaways. They are mind-boggling. And I, I think, you know, for, I suppose, those of us who have children, it's a concern, you know, for the future generations. I'm not sure that there's anything about those numbers that should I'll raise alarm bells immediately. They okay. don't seem to be impairing the ability of the global economy to recover in a way that is benign and friendly to market conditions. Mm -hmm. But somewhere down the road, uh, that debt will have to be reckoned with, and it could be a major problem if we go into another recession without the ability to use government financing to cushion the downturn and to help the economy recover. And do you think there's a potential return of market volatility as a result? Not necessarily as a result of indebtedness. I, I mean, I think it depends where you look. We're seeing bond yields rise today, and some of that has been attributed to the issuance, the auctions that took place in Europe in the course of today, which tended to weigh on the markets. And I do think bond yields will rise, although the primary reason is probably not the sum total of debt, but rather the evolution of the economy 
faster growth or at least more sustained growth, so pick up in inflation, and then ultimately a change in monetary policy. That's really what's going to drive interest rates, and that will at times be a volatile episode. Mm -hmm. Debt itself will probably be a story for another day. Volatility, though, mm -hmm. could surface for other reasons. For example, trade wars, those could be rekindled once again. Mm -hmm. We could see some volatility around other geopolitical risks that right now seem to be a bit at bay, but could resurface on a moment's notice. Um, bringing up now these geopolitical concerns and, of course, concerns of uh, the IMF in particular, protectionism. Um, do we see any signs of, of this slowing down or leaving? Well, I don't. The world economy has probably reached its peak rate of growth. Last year was a story of acceleration as a number of countries really began to join the expansion. And it is a very broad now synchronous expansion. But the point of acceleration was probably reached the maximum point in the fourth quarter of last year, maybe early this year. Most indicators now suggest that global growth is going to level off. I don't think there's much risk to the downside. I suppose for equity investors, what matters, though, is, is that the, the really the sweet spot is when growth accelerates because that's when profits grow their fastest. As growth begins to kind of peak and level off, profitability slows down somewhat and equity performance is commensurately not as strong. What does this mean for the central banks? Well, central banks are looking, obviously, at the rate of growth, and as it, as it moderates, then they perhaps are going to be a little bit less concerned about overheating. But they also look at how fully employed various economies are. And if you look at North America, United States and Canada, you look at Great Britain, look at Europe north of the Alps or Japan, mm. all of those economies that I've just mentioned are now fully employed, or in the case of Japan, well past the point of full employment to the point where there are outright shortages of labor, for example, and some other products. That means that central banks, where they have acted, probably still have work to do. The Fed itself has now prepared the markets for at least two more rate hikes this year, possibly three more, as well as a sequence of three rate hikes next year. Other central banks have not yet really moved. The ECB is tapering and will probably conclude the tapering of its asset purchases in September of this year. But it's got to then begin to prepare markets to raise rates. And Japan might surprise this year. They might actually lift their target for long-term government bond deals from 10 basis points, a ceiling thereof, to, say, 25 basis points. And that's where I think the uncertainty is going to come back into markets, is around central banks. And what does the debt mean for the central banks? Well, the central banks look at the debt and they recognize that as both their own policy rates and market rates rise, which has been a story in the world economy now for a couple of years, that it will gradually, the operative word here is gradually, increase the debt servicing costs for those entities that have issued the debt. So for households, probably, say, in the United States, less of a concern, uh, number one, because, say, short-term debt like credit cards are not really priced off of markets the way long-term debt, say, mortgages are. But mortgages are typically fixed at 30 years, so it's a relatively gradual evolution of higher interest rates beginning to affect, say, the housing market. Mm. The government, on the other hand, in the United States, funds itself pretty short-term. The average maturity of debt outstanding is only about four years, and that means that a quarter of that debt has to be refinanced, roughly speaking, every year. So as interest rates rise, that debt burden, that is the interest cost of servicing that mountain of U.S. government debt, is going to rise pretty quickly. And that's probably going to tie Congress's hands at some point in time. In other words, the deficits will then be getting even bigger, meaning that Congress will have to be looking for savings or potentially down the road tax increases to finance it. And those are the things I think central banks will be thinking about as they then think, well, how does this all affect growth? Uh, short term, minimal, medium term, probably more important. OK, to finish up, then, you know, given this conversation, especially uh, we're talking about these big uh, debt warnings and um, concerns, are we heading to what could the outlook look like? What's the outlook for the investors especially? Yeah, well, if we start first with the economic outlook, because that's really going to matter, matter a lot for markets, there's really not that much that looks to be imminent in terms of troubling news that's out there, right? The world economy, as I said before, is expanding mm -hmm. at a moderate but a healthy rate. Uh, the underpinnings of that growth are mostly led by things like job formation, household mm -hmm. income, as, in other words, and corporate profits, which is underpinning, amongst other things, 
a pickup in investment spending. None of that looks to be particularly at risk. But for markets, it's a slightly different story. Last year was sort of, in a sense, the best it could be. We saw accelerating growth, improving expectations for profitability, but subdued inflation and no threat that central banks would depart from this very predictable monetary policy. Along came February and we had something that many of us have termed wage rage. In other words, the market suddenly got in a twist about rising or accelerating wage inflation in the US. Now that hasn't quite worked out that way, but it was in a warning sign that if inflation now does begin to resurface in a more meaningful way, then you have this sort of juxtaposition of the good news being priced into the markets about earnings, but obviously a new source of uncertainty called what will central banks do about rising inflation that will be, I think, a concern. In the background will then be this debt burden we've been talking about here mm -hmm. as a potential break on economic activity if central banks raise interest rates enough. But the real question for 2018, it seems to me, is will inflation accelerate in a way that forces central banks to respond more aggressively than they have hitherto? All right, switching gears now, some of the most heated moments in sports sometimes take place on the sidelines or out of play when players are frustrated by referee calls in the game. Sports correspondent Matt Layton joins us live from Geneva today to talk about how to deal with those misbehaving players. Thanks for joining us, Matt. I have to say I love this topic because I often ask myself the same question, like these guys take out all of their frustrations on these referees and how do these referees deal with this? Anyway, take it away. Well, it's obviously, we're human. We're not computers. We all have amazing emotions. And when they're under stress, being watched by millions of people, it's not easy. Uh, the reason I'm talking about this today is the, uh, the Valley Football Association. In the low leagues, they're publishing what are the penalties for being naughty. So effectively, if you are applauding at a referee, clearly sarcastically, you have a one-match ban. If you're a bit more rude, insulting his judgment, that's a two-match ban. If you insult his mother, other, or incredibly uh, disagreeably rude, that's a three-match ban, and it goes up if you show him your bum, which apparently some people do, <laughs> it's a six-match ban. So imagine the case where you completely lose it. You show him your bum while insulting your mother and applauding at the same time. That means you're out for 11 matches. So uh, it's only in lower levels at the moment. But I, I do think something uh, something really has to happen because clearly the uh, the umpire can make mistakes. Well, not really allowed to, but they're only human as well. They have emotions. And, and this really needs to be solved. I'm... I, I, I have not witnessed most of those things. Well, I've, I've witnessed a lot of the insults and such, but showing them the bums, I don't think I've ever seen. I didn't even realize I was on the list of things that needed to be, <laughs> to be punished. But tell me, let's talk about some of the most classic examples of, of athletes insulting referees. I mean, who's, who are the naughtiest out there? Well, I tell you, it's often the high profile that clearly hit the public. And we saw recently, didn't we? We saw Gigi Buffon, who plays for Juventus. Now, they were in the later levels of the Champions League match, and he lost it. Uh, a penalty was given away. He didn't agree. And all 10 players surrounded the referee, and he was given a red card. The challenge here is a god in Italy. Everyone loves him, but it's not giving a good example, which is absolutely horrendous. Then we saw another example about the inconsistencies uh, in this sport. We saw Lionel Messi, uh, a great god, one of the best players in the world, playing for Argentina last year. He insulted a linesman. He was sent to the, He was sent by FIFA. They said, well, four match ban, which is automatic there. And then what happens? The Argentina said, well, no, you can't really do that. He has some important games coming up. And so FIFA rescinded. And they said, no, OK, you can get away with it this time. So, so my, my pain here is it's not fair. Uh, you know, you need to have a set of rules. And I think you certainly have to have the discipline. And in other sports, they manage to do it. But in football, I think clearly it's the most high profile and clearly it's the most high pressure. But I do think the referee personally should be given a lot more authority. Yeah, I, I have to say I agree with you. That doesn't sound very, very fair at all, to be honest. Now, what about other sports? I mean, let's take tennis or, or rugby or basketball. I think basketball is also pretty brutal, no? 
Basketball is all about being good. The problem with basketball is an indoor arena. There's microphones everywhere. Every single slur can be picked up. We all remember a couple of years ago when Kobe Bryant was at his absolute prime. He uh, he was sent to the sideline and he made a homophobic slur against uh, a referee. Of course, he apologized and said it was out of contact, not proved later. But he was fined $100,000 for doing that. Moving across to tennis, clearly we had the... the Wonderful example in 2009 of Serena Williams losing it completely and talking down to a lineswoman. She's actually fined 82,000 US dollars there and to be moved to said, if you do it again, you won't be able to play next year. I suppose the classic example is, is uh, also in the in the tennis is McEnroe, John McEnroe. Remember 1981? You cannot be serious. Now, he was fined $6,000 for that, fined 20 times in his career and in actual fact, $69,000 in his whole life. And if you've got a second, moving on to rugby, they know what you're doing. Only the captain there can talk to the actual referee, and the referee, if you root to him, you get sent off. So rugby knows what they're doing. Any back talk, well, well 10 we yards back. <laughs> Sorry, Matt, we're also going to have to, uh, we're going to have to cut end this. Thank you so much. It was very informative. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right, and stay with us. After the break, we're on the road with Front Seat. And tonight, we're looking at new vacation trends here in Switzerland and why caravanning is not just for your grandma. Stay with us. From climate change to international conflicts, human rights, and business ethics, on International Geneva, we will discuss global issues with some of the biggest stakeholders and explain why you should care. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need whenever, wherever you need it. Get the latest Swiss business and financial information on TV, on our website, cnnmoney.ch, or on your favorite social media platform. The best Swiss business news whenever and wherever you need it. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. How do you turn your idea into a successful business in Switzerland? If you want to develop your business, have individual mentoring and coaching, optimize your business model, develop a marketing strategy, acquire new skills, learn how to network, Romandie Formation, business opportunities anywhere. The Swiss Pulse delivers you the most important global and Swiss business and financial news, connecting Switzerland to the world. Tune in every weekday from 6 p.m. or find us on the go on our website or social media platforms. Business is always changing. Keep up with CNN Money. Maggie Lake is live in the heart of the world's economic epicenter, New York City, tracking all the action of the stock exchanges and the big business stories from around the world. Get top analysis of market movements and a daily breakdown of financial headlines. CNN Money with Maggie Lake. At the end of the business day, we're only just getting started. On the living markets from 6 to 7 p.m., we crunch the numbers on the financial markets, bring you the top analysis of the day, and set the agenda for tomorrow. Always with Switzerland important global links in mind. The living markets, weeknights from 6 to 7 p.m., only on CNN Money Switzerland. And seeing Shanghai the old-fashioned way. CNN Business Traveller in China. By the end of the next decade, the largest aviation market in the world. Are you ready for that? Businesses are spreading their wings. China Eastern, keeping the Chinese sky safe. <laughs> New ways to earn miles. Are you still a mileage geek? Yes, always. And bridging culture gaps. Don't ask on the next CNN Business Traveller. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. For somebody to, to tell you. When you think of the typical C-level executive on vacation, you'll be picturing white sandy beaches, icy cold cocktails, and blue sea and sky. But 
you could be wrong. More and more high-level business people are looking to get back to nature, and they're going camping. But before you picture soggy tents, ants, and burnt barbecue food, Hannah Wise has been to find out more about how it can be a luxurious treat for the whole family. It's tonight's edition of Front Seat. Welcome to the program. We've taken front seat on the road for this edition because, well, as you can see, spring has sprung, the weather's getting better, and we're all starting to think about vacation time. It's fair to say that camping has always been popular, but we're starting to see somewhat of a renaissance with caravanning and using a camper van. To tell us more about that, we're joined by Thomas Jenser, who is the CEO of City Peaks. What kind of trends are you seeing in this industry? There is an increasing demand of going on vacation with these kind of vehicles, um, just being on the road, being flexible, uh, maybe instead of having a tent, just having, having a very comfortable small vehicle that gives you access to all the different valleys and cities Switzerland has to offer. Describe the typical camper. Who, who is using this kind of vehicle? And who's caravanning? Because when I think of caravanning, I think of people older than my parents using the, the traditional caravan. This totally changed. I think about 10 years ago, yes, or 15 years ago, yes, that was probably the clientele you just mentioned. Um, these days, we really see a renaissance. It's a completely different clientele. These are bankers, for example. Bankers are people that just say in top positions that say, I have everything at home. I have a swimming pool, I have a whirlpool, but I want to I wanna go back to nature. So do you think this kind of vehicle and the new technologies within camping and caravanning and, and, and camper vans is actually kind of making the bridge for those people who perhaps aren't necessarily willing to stay the night in a tent? This vehicle has two levels. You can actually open the pop-up roof and up there it's like camping, like it, staying in a tent because it has tent walls. But down here it's the apartment. If it's raining, you just hear it like being in a car. And, but you're close in, it's comfortable, it's warm. Heating system, it's all there. Tell me about camping and the camping industry in Switzerland. Well, the camping industry, I think it's, uh, it's existing for a long time, but uh, we're focusing also on, it, on this different clientele. I think there are two different kinds of campers. The camper we always used to think about back in the old days more or less, has been the person that has been sitting in a car or in the RV driving down to Italy, um, staying for two weeks on the same campground and just enjoying the place where he is, making a reservation for the campground and staying there all the time. The customer that we are focusing on is actually is a traveler in his heart. He wants to discover things, he wants to uh, just be flexible and say, okay, now what's the weather today like? Okay, I want it to go this direction, but it doesn't look really good. My weather app says, let's go this direction. So you hit the road and you just follow your heart. And, and is Switzerland well equipped for that kind of person, for this traveler? Yeah, there could always be more. Of course, there is, a, I would say, about 400 campgrounds all over in Switzerland. So Switzerland is a camping country. Um, it has from rural, really, back to nature camping spots with great vistas to really well equipped campgrounds it has everything and what about people who are coming from overseas to switzerland well we, we would love to have more of them uh, switzerland is known also through the promotion of swiss tourism that people come over to switzerland they actually discover switzerland by train a big part of it and in my opinion, that's a great thing to discover Switzerland, no question about that. But I also believe that there are many people, for example, from North America, from Australia, that are, that are using that, that no camping from, from their own country, but they, they're not aware that this is a possibility to travel like this here in Switzerland as well. And actually, that's where your experience comes from, because you were involved in the camping and this industry over in Canada. Is it a similar situation there, or do they do it better than us? <laughs> I would say there it's just that's probably the number one way of, of experiencing the country. I mean, Canada has, uh, has just so much space and they have got thousands of campgrounds all over. 
And I think if you if we think about Canada, it's about being in nature. And to me, that's the best way to explore nature is you open the door and you're out. Uh, so it's, you're closer to nature. And Switzerland, I think, yeah, we can still do more. There could be more places. There could be more places you can just stay overnight, even if it's not a campground, but it's an official and allowed place. Can, can you actually do that? Can you just rock up? anywhere with a vehicle like this, put out your awning, pop up the, the top and, and you're set or are there rules and regulations yeah. really? There are rules and regulations. Um, one thing is what are the rules, the other thing is what, what, what the customers or the people actually do. The regulations is it's, it's a little bit complicated. Um, camping, now we're camping because the chairs and the table is outside. If this wouldn't be outside and you're just taking a power nap, you're tired. It's parking. It's parking. <laughs> okay. It's parking, yes. And so how do we make that change then? Is that a barrier for people? No, it's not a barrier because there are many people that say, I, I don't want to just stay somewhere and just sleep there because I don't, I don't feel comfortable. Is it allowed or not? Question mark. For example, I, I prefer this way of traveling with my family as well. So last year we spent 49 nights in, in a VW like this. And my kids never want to camp wild. You always want to stay in campgrounds. And your whole family can stay in a vehicle of this size? Yes. How many people? Four people. Four people? Yes, two kids, nine and eleven. Okay, yeah. well, it so... It brings the family together. <laughs> I bet it does. So, are you trying to bring that whole Canadian idea of vacationing to Switzerland? Yeah, you know, it's. I think it's in my. It's in my blood. It's in my heart. Um, just the, this flexible way of discovering things. And to me, what I'm more looking for is campgrounds that are a little bit more rural, a little bit more out in the green, in, in the bush, where you have this nature feeling a bit more. In my secret aspect, places. You know, secret places, and of course, I know quite a few of them. And we share it with our customers and and this is to me also this is this canadian feeling we're having here in switzerland as well and also uh, we'll, we'll talk about your business model now because really you're making this kind of travel more accessible to people because it's a big investment how, how much does one of these cost well <laughs> i could talk for, for a long <laughs> time now basic um, price our, our, our vehicles are <laughs> equipped um not just basic they, they really have almost everything in there. So they start at about uh, 65,000 brand new and they go up to 90,000, 94,000 best model. Yeah. And so people can rent these from City Peaks? Yes. And then how much does that yeah. cost? In the off season on a weekly on a weekly price, a vehicle like this is 890 Swiss francs a week. But this is including more or less everything. It's a 1,050 kilometers in there, it's kitchen, kitchen, uh, kitchen equipment, it's preparation fee, it's uh, it's the cleaning. So this is your it's hotel and your hire car exactly. all in one. I think that's the important <laughs> point, it's not per person, it's, it's, uh, it's per vehicle and it's your car and it's your hotel. So what's your business model then? Because obviously you have quite a few of these to, to rent out and then what do you do with them at the end of the season? Yeah, the business model is, uh, number one is renting premium camper vans, premium RVs, but mm -hmm. only in the compact class. That's that's the first thing. The second thing is selling them at the end of the season because it's a strategic decision from us. We only want to rent every year brand new vehicles. So we're selling them at the end of the season. And then obviously buyers get a good deal at the end. Um, it's, it's all about having a good purchase price. It's about having your costs Con on the control and of course it's about uh, the revenue during the season and at the end the selling price but it's a thin line here on front seat we've been talking a lot about in recent weeks about uh, scooter sharing car sharing yeah. is there such a thing as caravan sharing yeah. yes it's existing the sharing economy is of course uh, um, a big a big challenge for the entire tourism industry Airbnb is uh, is is huge and uh, all the hotels actually uh, feel it, feel this kind of industry as well. There are the same platforms in, in the RV industry as well. Um, Do you feel threatened by them? Of course it's competition as well. But on the other hand we also believe that, as we just mentioned before, it's your car and it's your hotel. And if this service is not perfect, 
you're probably not going to have a good vacation. So we believe that uh, the customers we're looking for, they're willing to pay maybe an extra buck uh, to really have a brand new vehicle that is uh, maintained by two top mecha uh, mechanics, that is perfectly clean, it's just, it's, it's all top and they know the base, the camper is there and it's going to be good. And technically it's going to be tipped off as well, shall we go inside and have a look at what's on offer these sure. days? All right, well, why don't you start by explaining some of the comfort factors, because that's really the selling point of this kind of vehicle, isn't it? It is, yes. To me, the biggest point or the biggest plus in these compact cars is it's a space miracle. You've got everything on just a four, three or four square meters. For example, this seat here unfolds to double bed, or uh, you've got a complete kitchen here. Um, and if you want, yeah, I can make I can make coffee. Oh yes, please. <laughs> and uh, so it's very it's very convenient, very easy. And um, actually, you can also just push a button, and then you uh, have another double bed upstairs. In the roof. In the roof, yeah. So it actually suits for for people. What kind of people are using this vehicle? I mean, you mentioned bankers, but what kind of age group? Well, a little bit of everything, but I would say I would say it's a uh, average thirty-five to maybe sixty-five years old. They're using it. And how does it differ from a caravan? This space. The big plus of this vehicle is really the access. You can go everywhere. Europe, in North America, for example, there I'd take a really big RV because you've got space. The roads are big and wide and the parking spots are no problem at all but here in Europe in Switzerland streets are narrow you want to go to you always somewhere in a village or in a, in a city and um, it, it's just narrow and and I think with these vehicles you have access right downtown and you can park in every parking lot and the European market is a big market then for this size of vehicle the European market is a big market for this size of the vehicle I, I mean we've got many customers Swiss customers that either say yes we want to explore Switzerland or yes we go north we go uh, towards Norway or we go down to France and they travel by this by this vehicle and do you think we'll start to see more electric style vehicles of this size in the future do you think that could even change the industry again yes you know I, I believe so I mean uh, uh, it's to me as well I mean there's you should, should always have visions and to me it would be fantastic if one of these days uh, there would be an e an electric uh, camper with solar panels yeah, perhaps solar in there <laughs> but uh, it's still a long ways because uh, these uh, campers are or have the purpose to travel and there is just not enough electrical power or uh, hookups actually where it can charge your batteries right now in europe and, and do, do you think um where, where do you where will you be going on holiday this year do you think <laughs> You know, whenever friends are asking me that, <laughs> I always say, ask me two days ahead, because I think you're doing something wrong if you're just fixing your routing and then you're traveling right into the bad weather. So we're actually, we're having a routing in mind and then we look two days ahead or, or before we actually check I was going to say, because you have to book a vehicle like this in advance. I mean, yeah. you can't be yeah. so yeah. free that you can yeah. just call up and take yeah. off. Yeah, you, can, you, can, you have to book the vehicle, but you don't have to fix the campground. You just go, you just go. You, we've traveled all over Europe in high season with the kids, no problem. We always find a place. And so where do you see the future here in Switzerland? Well, I believe there's, there are going to be more campgrounds. Uh, there's going to be, uh, it, it's an increasing industry. And, uh, but Swiss, Swiss, tour, Swiss tourism actually invented a great thing. It's a grand tour of Switzerland two or three years ago because touring is a worldwide trend. And so they, they realized we should do something. Switzerland is fantastic. And they invented the grand tour, which is a, mm -hmm. uh, a tour around Switzerland, 1600 kilometers. And uh, it's a fantastic, uh, it's a fantastic routing. I can just recommend it. Yeah. Okay. Well, it sounds like our coffee's nearly ready. Uh, Thomas Jensen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Mm. All right, and that's it for the living markets tonight. Coming up next is the big picture here on the Swiss Pulse. Now, I will say goodbye to you for one hour. I will be back, however, because in our third hour. 
we will have our first ever executive talk segment with Josef Ackerman. Don't want to miss it. Thanks so much for being with us, and I'll see you in a bit. Welcome to the CNN Money Switzerland weekend weather, starting with Saturday. And here are the comfort indexes for the Swiss cities. Let's have a look for Saturday in Europe. And the comfort indexes for some cities. Let's go to Sunday in Switzerland. And here are the comfort indexes. Sunday in Europe. And discover the more attractive cities based on the weather. the latest gadgets understand where robotics will take us next find out more about the pioneers and their latest research join us on tech talk where we'll be meeting the people behind the big ideas here in switzerland and around the world and finding out what it means for businesses consumers and the planet tech talk with anna maria montero on cnn money switzerland business is always changing Keep up with CNN Money. Maggie Lake is live in the heart of the world's economic epicenter, New York City, tracking all the action of the stock exchanges and the big business stories from around the world. Get top analysis of market movements and a daily breakdown of financial headlines. CNN Money with Maggie Lake. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need whenever, wherever you need it. Get the latest Swiss business and financial information on TV, on our website, cnnmoney.ch, or on your favorite social media platform. The best Swiss business news whenever and wherever you need it. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. along the learning curve our program dedicated to education in switzerland its future and the business behind it learning curve with amanda kane on cnn money switzerland somebody to, to tell you their story it's it's something i take really seriously it's not something you can just parachute in and ask somebody to open their heart to you to peel away the layers to get to the heart of the person who you're telling a story about france will never give up against the terrorists and delve beneath the, the surface of what's happening you can hear their story and you're going to do their story justice Thank you. you have to show yourself to Thank them you. so right now they're hovering pretty low over this area that, that's uh, extensively flooded. CNN's the right place to tell their story. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need whenever, wherever you need it. On our website, cnnmoney.ch, or on your favorite social media platform. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. <laughs>
A big debate about big numbers. Where and why should Facebook, Google or Amazon pay taxes and how much? French President Emmanuel Macron is proposing a new tax to help boost the European Union's budget. In our big picture tonight, we take a look at the issue of taxation in the digital economy. And coming up in our third hour, we are launching our very first executive talk. This new weekly segment takes a closer look at the business and opinion leaders of Switzerland and what makes them tick. We start off with one of the most successful and at the same time controversial Swiss managers of the recent past, Joseph Ackermann. And we ask him about the greediness of some bankers leading up to the financial crisis. But yes, I think we were uh, too short-term driven uh, and uh, that was one of, the, one of the issues that, you know, you created, generated volume, got a good compensation and then a few years later you have discovered that some of these deals were actually bad deals and, and, and were backfiring. A very warm spring welcome. You're watching The Big Picture. I'm Martina Fuchs. Let's kick off the show. Let's take a look now at the top stories making news here in Switzerland and around the world. Andy Ries, a Swiss businessman who owned the BMC Racing Cycling Team and the Young Boys Soccer Club, has died at the age of 75. His death comes with the Young Boys close to winning its first Swiss League title in 32 years. As BMC owner, Ries secured a Tour de France title five years after his previous team was involved in a doping scandal. Andy Ries' biggest achievement as an entrepreneur is co-founding the hearing aid company Phonak, today's Sonova. Sonova is a world leader in this industry. In a statement, Robert Schwerry, chairman of Sonova, said that Sonova has not only lost a great friend, but also a multi-talented and passionate entrepreneur. It seems Switzerland is paying more and more to stay healthy. The Federal Statistical Office reports that just over 80 billion Swiss francs were spent in 2016, a nearly 4% increase over the previous year. Similar increases can be expected in the next two years, according to the COF Swiss Economic Institute. The forecast attributes these growth rates to political measures and rising salaries. Meanwhile, private health spending is also on the rise, with health-related costs accounting for 15% of household budgets versus just 10% in 1993. Takeda has offered to buy drug maker Shire for $60 billion. Yes, $60 billion. That's according to Reuters news agency. This would officially kick off what would be one of the biggest corporate takeovers ever by a Japanese company. The deal would give Takeda, Japan's biggest drug maker, a broader global reach and key treatments that are in the late stages of testing. The possible offer comes after Shire agreed on Monday to sell its cancer units to Francis Servier for 2.4 billion US dollars. Shire's shares, which are listed in London, surged as much as 7.6% after the report. Takeda has so far declined to comment on the deal. The world's debt pile has ballooned to a record 164 trillion US dollars, a trend that could make it harder for countries to respond to the next recession and pay off debt if financing conditions tighten, the IMF said. Global public and private debt swells to 
225% of global GDP in 2016. The global debt burden clouded the IMF's otherwise upbeat outlook on the global economy, which is in its strongest upswing since 2011. Speaking earlier today, IMF head Christine Lagarde addressed the annual spring meetings of the IMF and the World Bank Group and cautions that a escalation of trade war poses a real threat to the world economy. And coming up in our big picture tonight, we look at the future of the EU's proposed digital tax and how it could reshape the digital economy. Stay tuned here on CNN Money Switzerland. CNN Money Switzerland weather. We start with the webcam of the day. Here is an overview of the values recorded in the last hours. And now the map of Swiss warnings. Let's have a look to the forecast for this afternoon. And for tomorrow. Here is an overview for the next days in German speaking Switzerland. In Western Switzerland. And south of the Alps. Thanks for following us. Welcome back to the big picture, ladies and gentlemen, where we are talking about big numbers, big companies and a big debate that's happening around digital tax. The digital economy is growing and so is its earnings. Tech giants like Facebook, Microsoft and Amazon are among the household names that are thriving thanks to the global demand for their digital products. But when it comes to tax, some argue it's not a two-way street. And in March, the European Commission unveiled its long-awaited plans for a digital tax on the revenues earned by these types of companies. The most dramatic dramatic one is an interim measure that would put a 3% tax on revenue generated from digital activities, including online advertising and the sale of user data. On Tuesday, French President Emmanuel Macron proposed a new tax on the digital economy to help finance the European Union budget. Sera la taxation du numérique. Secondly, taxing the digital, falling on the Commission's proposal, will create a short-term tax that will put an end to the most shocking excesses. I support such a proposal. It is essential and furthermore, I hope, pave the way for own resources for the future budget. So, is Europe moving too aggressively to raise billions more in tax from big tech companies? Well, passing the law might not be plain sailing. Have a look at this chart here. According to research by Politico, Ireland, for example, is against the proposed tax. Greece is also against it, while Spain, France and Poland are very supportive. So what do we make of all this? Well, my colleague Hannah Weiss spoke with Christoph Scherer from the consulting company PwC. He is a tax partner at PwC in Switzerland. She asked him all about the pros and the cons. What's driving it forward is, is, is basically numbers. It's just this perception that on a corporate tax level, they're paying less tax and they're just... Is that a simple problem or is it more complex than that? I think it's more complex, but I think on the, the headline figures you can see, you can say, okay, they pay 10%, the rest of the economy pays on average 25%, so they're paying less. So it seems unfair, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is then part of the political agenda to say, okay, how do we correct this? 
And currently, the proposal is saying um, there will be a midterm solution, which will be a multilateral solution, uh, let's say the G20 OECD. But in the short term, we want to do something. So here's a short term fix, sort of a, a bandage, right? And what would that fix be? That fix would be that I would say larger players would pay uh, a percentage of their revenue they have in certain markets as a tax. So they're discussing 3%. Mm-hmm. So it's basically, it's not really a tax on, on profits, it's a tax on revenue and it's a proxy for the profits they're extracting out of a certain market. It's interesting though, because you're saying on one hand that the EU is saying it's not fair, but then if we impose new tax rules, then these companies is going to say, hang on a minute, that's not fair either. I think these companies have accepted that the rules will change, uh, generally speaking, to to be able to tax in an adequate fashion the digital players. Um, um, I don't know what their exact positions are around this. Will they try to get around it, do you think? I mean, will I, they just I, look for another loophole? I, I don't think the way these these new rules are structured, there's no rule around, uh, there's no way around it. Because in essence, um, they're not taxing the structure, so how you structure things or how you structure your value chain or anything you do, they're basically looking at where do your basically customers sit, where do you make revenues, and then basically on that revenue basis, they want to tax you. So it's, it's a very crude proxy. So um, because of that, I think the, we have this low kind of tax rate or this idea of 3%. How, how quickly do you think we'll start to see this change just quickly on this? Um, not sure if we will see it at all because <laughs> because uh, you know all state all EU member states will have to say yes to this. I think um, what the EU Commission has done is brought down the headline rate. So they were talking like up to five percent. So they mm. brought it down to three. It sounds a little bit like a political compromise. Um, it might be that in the end it doesn't come. But at the same time, it for me it it sounds a bit like a, a bit of a political stick to get things moving ahead because basically they're saying if we don't get a multilateral solution soon we will kind of move ahead unilaterally. But they can at the same time work on this second stream this kind of whole the way the tax regulation and this the wider issue. Yes but that is you know that's an OECD G20 so that is a highly technical debate which can go on for years and you know the OECD is talking about 2020 for a framework but that could then be 2025 or you know so I think and what it, are we talking about specifically here though these I think here here we think we're talking about two things one is the question where should companies pay tax mm-hmm. so will you kind of have a a tax presence even if you don't have a physical presence in a country and the answer is likely to be yes so it's kind of you have a digital uh, permanent establishment, mm. even if you don't have any physical assets in a territory. That's number one. And, number and we're still talking digital here. Yes. We are. We okay. are talking digital. And second is, once I know that you should be paying tax in this territory, the question of attribution arises. So how much tax should you be paying based on your global profits? And this is a question of basically how do you share the tax revenue between mm-hmm. countries, which is an immensely political debate, obviously. You know, digital tax is incredibly complex. We were talking uh, just before we came in for this interview about the Facebook scenario and how they have B2B and they have B2C, different kind of strategies. And when you come to brick and mortar, bricks and mortar, it's a very kind of similar footprint. I mean, just can you tell us a bit more about, you know, how different digital taxes to give the impression uh, to show us how complex. I think that the challenge arises that in in a digital economy the players act slightly differently to bricks and mortar business bricks and mortar businesses they typically invest in a certain area and they expect revenue from this area so you have this this is the footprint basically and you tax based on that investment footprint so where do you have people where do you have assets where do you have IP now, if you take Google as an example, you know, Google invests in creating a search engine, creating other products, you know, mm-hmm. maps and so on. This is where they invest and they create a experience for me and you, others. So it's a B2C experience. This is where they invest. The in rev- the United States? In the United States, but also in Zurich, you know, <laughs> we know. So they invest heavily in, this is the area they invest in. Okay. Where do they make the revenue? 
they make the revenue on selling ad space or ads. So it's a different area. So they extract the revenue from people who want to buy ads. Okay, right? so we're starting to see how difficult it will be to unravel all this. Yeah. So and take responsibility. In, in, in an old school or old economy, this would have been in the same place, right? So I'm a newspaper printer. I print my newspaper here. I distribute my newspaper here. And I sell my ads here, right? Mm -hmm. Digital is completely different. I create, I produce over here, I sell over here. It's geographically not the same. How do companies, specifically digital companies, kind of prepare for new tax strategies? We talked a little bit about how they do communicate with, you know, policymakers. I, I, I don't think they prepare differently from others, actually. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think the preparation is, is much different. I think, like all companies, you know, they try to strive for the right amount of tax that they should be paying. They try the lowest to amount of tax. <laughs> not necessarily. I would say the lowest sustainable level, right? And uh, therefore, they just analyze the regulatory framework and say, well, based on this regulatory framework, to be compliant, this is about where we could end up. Now, the digital players, they have an advantage in the sense that they are a lot more movable, they have a lot more movable assets, so your algorithms can sit here, or they can sit here, or they can sit here. Well, if you have a factory, it's hard to move your factory, mm. right? So they have more ability to maneuver, and I think that's the, the key difference, right? But I, I actually think over the next years, the industries will become more alike, because if you look at the more bricks and mortar organizations, they are trying to move become more digital. They are also trying to exploit data. They are trying to exploit AI, algorithms, and so on. So they will be creating more movable components mm -hmm. compared to the past. So they will become more similar. Actually. Okay, and this is kind of where we're going with that third stream. You yes. know, things are going to evolve a lot when it comes to tax in the future because whereas we're introducing a new digital tax, we'll be losing tax revenue in other places. Uh, yes, I mean, if you just think of the overall transformation of the economy as, as digital evolves, you know, and, and people are talking about you know, self-driving cars mm -hmm. and, and electro you know, battery-powered mm -hmm. cars. Uh, currently, in, in Switzerland, for example, um, the roads are paid mainly by uh, duties on fossil fuels, so on the fuel consumption. If we all drive solar-powered cars there will no longer be this tax revenue on the income side for the state. The question is, how, how will we, we pay for yeah. roads, right? So we will have to come up with something else, which could be a road tax. Mm -hmm. Would the road tax be with tolling stations? Or will it be with GPS, basically kilometers traveled? Will it be per capita? All of those things we have to work up out in the next couple of years. It seems like, is, can I say that it's an exciting time to be in tax right now? Is that a step too far? <laughs> I think it's generally an exciting time to be in business or okay. alive. Uh, I but think, it seems to me there's a lot changing. Yes, I think for, as a tax coming. professional, you could say the last couple of years have been more stable. Now uh -huh. we are moving into a more disruptive phase. And I think uh, as a tax professional, it's a lot of fun, yes, because... Uh, we're going to see different systems evolving, experiments by governments, and uh, yeah, it's just interesting, yes. Do you worry that your job will become digitalized as well? Um, maybe not me. I, I, think, <laughs> I, I think I'm OK. Um, um, I, I think, as a tax professional, what is interesting is that you will have to be a lot closer to business because the business is changing and to be a good tax advisor, you need to understand where business will move towards. Uh, and this brings you a lot closer to business. So I think the, the tax advisor of the future is first a business person, then second a, a tax advisor. All right, Christoph Scherer, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Coming up, we dig deeper into the topic with an expert on Swiss tax, talking about digital tax in Switzerland. We're taking a short break now here on CNN Money Switzerland to Swiss polls. Don't go away. Who are the men and women in charge of Swiss companies, institutions and organizations? What drives those business leaders? What challenges do they face? What makes them tick? Join me once a week for an up-close and personal look at the CEOs, 
chairmen and chairwomen of this country. The executive talk only on CNN Money Switzerland. Excuse me, miss, you dropped this. No, it's just a penny. Just a penny? Just a penny? It all begins with the humble penny. Whether writing your first cheque or cashing big cheques. To those at the top, making their mark, closing deals round the clock. On Quest Means Business, we know every penny has power. And it's not how many you have. It's what you do with them that counts. That's the marvel of money. Quest means business. What a profitable hour. and fast paced so buckle up as front seat brings you the latest news and views from the automotive world car developments industry news interviews with successful drivers the latest trends and next level innovation here in switzerland and around the world on front seat we'll keep you on the right road front seat with hannah wise on cnn money switzerland We try to be global and we try to be smart. What I want to hear are authentic voices of people who are passionate or intelligent, and that's the consistency that we try to get at. For Reed Zakaria GPS. CNN Money Switzerland is designed to flow through information. Our network provides a unique take on live, worldwide financial news. We are not your common news outlet. Instead, we act as a global catalyst of interconnected information. Our live studio provides you with a detailed and sharp analysis, predicting what is yet to come. From the heart of Europe, watch CNN Money Switzerland. Welcome back to the big picture, everybody. Tonight, uh, uh, we are zooming in on the digital tax. What's behind this controversial European idea? Well, for more, we are now crossing live to Xavier Oberson. He is a lawyer and professor at the University of Geneva, who is joining us live from our studio in Geneva. Mr. Oberson, welcome to the program. Great to have you with us. Thank you very much. Uh, Let's start with a general view on the topic, uh, Mr. Oberson. Does a digital tax actually really make sense in your opinion? Yes, it does, because the, the economy has completely changed. And uh, the, the, the global tax system was designed roughly in the 1920s, actually, after the First World War. I'll so you see the kind completely. of completely outdated and now the new economy uh, still applies the same the same rules of taxation so they should be redesigned but the the, the problem we have to face is that uh, some countries are willing to take unilateral or measures and this maybe it's not a right solution because I think uh, it would be better to have a more coordinated approach. So Emmanuel Macron, the French president, is really taking the lead there. If you look at the proposed solution of the EU Commission and himself, what do you make of it? Like he really wants to make a st statement and advance in these uh, negotiations and talks. Yes, he wants to advance because probably he fears that other states uh, do not want to enter into the scene, at least uh, immediately. So maybe it's showing, uh, it's showing a vision, it's showing a trend, which corresponds to the view of the uh, EU Commission. But what is, would be important, this could be a, a short-term solution, but in the long-term solution, we should really redesign 
the global tax system and and especially share the, the profits in so a different way. So what is your way. proposal there, Mr. Oberson, how to reshape this uh, global regulation? How to reshape is to, uh, and this is what the EU proposes, is to look at where the value is created. And right now, uh, the residence country of all these corporations gets most, if not all, of the profits. And this is not fair, because the customers are everywhere, the, the users have a very important role in the, in the making of the profits. So we should redesign, I think, this allocation rule and to give, uh, to give more share to, to the states, to other states, which participate in this value creation. And do you think the proposal of 3% uh, is fair? I think it's it's fair, but but still it's really uh, only a short term short term solution because it's one single country, uh, as Italy, which is also proposing something uh, a bit similar. It's not really coordinated right now, so it can be a trend, but in a in a short in a in a mid and long term, a more global solution is necessary. Now, if, and it's still a big if, if the proposal goes through, what will it mean for Switzerland and the tech giants like Google, which are also based here? Yeah, it means that Switzerland would have to, uh, to participate in a way or another to this, to this system. And uh, the, the federal government has already mentioned, I think it was in March this year, that uh, they made a position paper and they said that they will basically follow this approach, but they follow. They, they also favor a, a more global and coordinated approach, and which also should take into account what we call double taxation treaties, because the problem of this measure is sometimes they, they are designed in a way which uh, are, are not in accordance with some of the international rules which are currently existing. Now, Switzerland, for now, is very much focused on the tax proposal 17 here at home, yeah. pretty much in a wait-and-see attitude when it comes to the uh, EU digital tax. Should it start and roll up its uh, sleeves on the uh, digital taxation front as well? Well, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I think we should first focus on this uh, tax reform, uh, reform uh, which is called uh, uh, the P P Project 17. This is really urgent, I think, because uh, Switzerland has made an international commitment to implement this reform and basically to suppress some of these uh, special continental regimes which are against uh, some of the international standard. So there's really an emergency here. And when we can achieve that, then at the second stage, we should really try to uh, focus on digital taxation. But, you know, the Swiss system, it takes time. There could be a referendum, people, which is, which is OK. People will have to vote. So let's first do this uh, uh, step, and then we can enter into the second one. The consensus is, however, in Switzerland that the uh, tax proposal 17 would go through and Parliament could approve it as early as uh, the autumn uh, season. Do you agree with that? Are you bullish that this will go through? Well, uh, if you would have asked me this question one month ago, I would have said exactly the same. But in the meantime, there's been uh, many criticism coming from different areas. Which are uh, some of the criticisms? Uh, and the, what are the critics yes. are saying? Uh, for example, the, some, uh, the, the small and medium enterprise lobby is saying that they don't want to have an increase in the taxation of dividends. So that's one side. The, the left parties want uh, to make sure that there's not too many uh, 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 taxes that disappear. They want to focus also on some social measures. And then you have also some distinction between some cantons. Zurich uh, tries to favor a, a special regime, which is called the national interest deduction, while Geneva for, on, on another spectrum, focuses more on the on the lowering of the rate. So it is a typical Swiss situation where you need to find a compromise between these various requirements. I think we will we will find it, but we should be really careful based on the experience from uh, from from last year. Right, uh, Mr. Oberson. Before we go, are politicians in Switzerland actually discussing? the issue of digital tax already? What are your sources saying? And um, are all eyes really on this uh, tax proposal 17 now? 
Yes, I think they really focus on the taxation 17. Uh, I didn't hear very much uh, about digital taxation in Switzerland so far, uh, apart from this position paper from the, from the Swiss government. Thank you so much uh, for your time, Mr. Oberson, and I hope to have you on the show again very soon. Have a great yes, evening. Thank you very much. Some of the most heated moments in sports sometimes take place on the sidelines or out of play when players are frustrated by referee calls in the game. Earlier, Ana Maria Montero asked Matt Leighton, our sports correspondent, how to deal with those misbehaving players. Take a look. Well, it's obviously... We're human, we're not computers. We all have amazing emotions. And when they're under stress, being watched by millions of people, it's not easy. Uh, the reason I'm talking about this today is the, uh, the Valley Football Association. In the low leagues, they're publishing, what are the penalties for being naughty? So effectively, if you are applauding at a referee, clearly sarcastically, you have a one match ban. If you're a bit more rude, insulting his judgment, that's a two match ban. If you insult his mother or incredibly uh, disagreeably rude, that's a three match ban. And it goes up if you show him your bum, which apparently some people do, <laughs> it's a six match ban. So imagine the case where you completely lose it. You show him your bum while insulting your mother and applauding at the same time. That means you're out for 11 matches. So uh, it's only in lower levels at the moment. But I, I do think something uh, something really has to happen because clearly the uh, the umpire can make mistakes. Well, not really allowed to, but they're only human as well. They have emotions. And, and this really needs to be solved. I am. I, I, I have not witnessed most of those things. Well, I've, I've witnessed a lot of the insults and such, but showing him the bums, I don't think I've ever seen. I didn't even realize I was on the list of things that needed to be, to be punished. But tell me, let's talk about some of the most classic examples of, of athletes insulting referees. I mean, who's, who are the naughtiest out there? Well, I tell you, it's often the high profile that clearly hit the public. And we saw recently, didn't we? We saw Gigi Buffon, who plays for Juventus. Now, they were in the later levels of the Champions League match, and he lost it. Uh, a penalty was given away. He didn't agree. And all 10 players surrounded the referee, and he was given a red card. The challenge here is a god in Italy. Everyone loves him, but it's not giving a good example, which is absolutely horrendous. Then we saw another example about the inconsistencies uh, in this sport. We saw Lionel Messi, uh, a great god, one of the best players in the world, playing for Argentina last year. He insulted a linesman. He was sent to the, He was sent by FIFA. They said, well, four match ban, which is automatic there. And then what happens? The Argentinas said, well, no, you can't really do that. He has some important games coming up. And so FIFA rescinded. And they said, no, OK, you can get away with it this time. So, so my, my pain here is it's not fair. Uh, you know, you need to have a set of rules. And I think you certainly have to have the discipline. And in other sports, they manage to do it. But in football, I think clearly it's the most high profile and clearly it's the most high pressure. But I do think the referee personally should be given a lot more authority. Yeah, I, I have to say I agree with you. That doesn't sound very, very fair at all, to be honest. Now, what about other sports? I mean, let's take tennis or, or rugby or basketball. I think basketball is also pretty brutal, no? Basketball is all about being good. The problem with basketball is in an indoor arena, there's microphones everywhere. Every single slur can be picked up. We all remember a couple of years ago when Kobe Bryant was at his absolute prime. He, uh, he was sent to the sideline and he made a homophobic slur against uh, a referee. Of course, he apologized and said he was out of contact, not proved later. But he was fined $100,000 for doing that. Moving across to tennis, clearly we had the one. The wonderful example in 2009 of Serena Williams losing it completely and talking down to uh, a lineswoman. She's actually fined 82,000 US dollars there and to be moved to said, if you do it again, you won't be able to play next year. I suppose the classic example is, is uh, also in the, in the tennis is McEnroe, John McEnroe. Remember 1981? You cannot be serious. Now, he was fined $6,000 for that, fined oh. 20 times in his career and in actual fact, $69,000 in his whole life. And if you've got a second, moving on to rugby, they know what you're doing. Only the captain there can talk to the actual referee. And the referee, if you're rude to him, you get sent off. So rugby knows what they're doing. Any back talk as well, well, 10 we yards back. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. We're also going to have to, uh, we're gonna have to cut end this. Thank you so much. It was very informative. Thanks for joining us. 
A new look at the new big screen dinosaur, an actress heads into danger, and why are directors giving their actors fake scripts? CNN's David Daniel has the answer in the Hollywood Minute. What is that thing? They made it. This is the most dangerous creature that ever walked the earth. <laughs> Universal has dropped the final trailer for Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, roaring into theaters June 22nd. Here's a look. These creatures were here before us. And if we're not careful, they're gonna be here after. Welcome to Jurassic World. Lily Collins is set to fight for survival. She'll star in Titan as a young musician investigating the death of her sister, an environmental activist, in a remote forest. Her own life is endangered when she travels to the same forest. The security around the plot of Avengers Infinity War is so tight, not even some of the actors know what happens. Directors the Russo brothers tell BBC Radio Scotland they've given several actors, including Tom Spider-Man Holland, who's revealed spoilers in the past, fake scripts to avoid leaks. In fact, they say no one in the cast has seen the entire real script. They'll find out Monday at the world premiere. The rest of us can see for ourselves beginning April 27th. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. Stay with us. After the break, we're on the road with front seat. And tonight, we're looking at new vacation trends here in Switzerland and why caravanning is not just for your grandma. How do you turn your idea into a successful business in Switzerland? If you want to develop your business, have individual mentoring and coaching, optimize your business model, develop a marketing strategy, acquire new skills, learn how to network. Romandie Formation. Business opportunities anywhere. the world with Becky Anderson. It all starts here. Changing, fighting, creating, connecting. That's why we're here. We live here, we work here, we're from here. And we'll go wherever the story takes us. I'm Becky Anderson in Tehran. We are in Jerusalem. Real news that shapes our world. Exploring not just what's going on, but why. I just want to press you on one further point. Getting perspective on this region from this region. Places that many of us know, but few of us get to see. Observing countries on the move, still rooted in tradition. It all starts here, and that's why we're here, bringing you the world from our Middle Eastern hub. Connect the world with Becky Anderson. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need whenever, wherever you need it. Get the latest Swiss business and financial information on TV, on our website, cnnmoney.ch, or on your favorite social media platform. The best Swiss business news whenever and wherever you need it. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. make sure you're feeling good. Join us on Feeling Good, the program that brings you the latest innovation in Switzerland for a long and healthy life. Feeling Good with Amanda Kane on CNN Money Switzerland. Since the founding of the Red Cross in 1863, the city of Geneva has a long tradition of hosting international organizations. In our program, International Geneva, we'll be exploring issues of international cooperation, humanitarian assistance and human rights. 
and talk to international players about the challenges and solutions to global problems. International Geneva with Martina Fuchs on C. When you think of the typical C-level executive on vacation, you'll be picturing white sandy beaches, icy cold cocktails and blue sea and sky. But you could be wrong. More and more high-level business people are looking to get back to nature and they are going camping. But before you picture soggy tents, ants and burnt barbecue food, Hannah Wise has been to find out more about how it can be a treat for the whole family. It's tonight's edition of Front Seat. Welcome to the program. We've taken front seat on the road for this edition because, well, as you can see, spring has sprung, the weather's getting better, and we're all starting to think about vacation time. It's fair to say that camping has always been popular, but we're starting to see somewhat of a renaissance with caravanning and using a camper van. To tell us more about that, we're joined by Thomas Jenser, who is the CEO of City Peaks. What kind of trends are you seeing in this industry? There is an increasing demand of going on vacation with these kind of vehicles, um, just being on the road, being flexible, uh, maybe instead of having a tent, just having, having a very comfortable small vehicle that gives you access to all the different valleys and cities Switzerland has to offer. Describe the typical camper. Who, who is using this kind of vehicle? And who's caravanning? Because when I think of caravanning, I think of people older than my parents using the, the traditional caravan. This totally changed. I think about 10 years ago, yes, or 15 years ago, yes, that was probably the clientele you just mentioned. Um, these days, we really see a renaissance. It's a completely different clientele. These are bankers, for example. Bankers are people that just say in top positions that say, I have everything at home. I have a swimming pool, I have a whirlpool, but I wanna, I wanna go back to nature. So do you think this kind of vehicle and the new technologies within camping and caravanning and, and, and camper vans is actually kind of making the bridge for those people who perhaps aren't necessarily willing to stay the night in a tent? This vehicle has two levels. You can actually open the pop-up roof and up there it's like camping, like it, staying in a tent because it has tent walls. But down here it's the apartment. If it's raining you just hear it like being in a car. And, but you're close in, it's comfortable, it's warm, heating system, it's all there. Tell me about camping and the camping industry in Switzerland. Well, the camping industry, I think it's, uh, it's existing for a long time, but uh, we're focusing also on, it, on this different clientele. I think there are two different kinds of campers. The camper we always used to think about, back in the old days more or less, has been the person that has been sitting in a car or in the RV driving down to Italy, um, staying for two weeks on the same campground and just enjoying the place where he is, making a reservation for the campground and staying there all the time. The customer that we are focusing on is actually is a traveler in his heart. He wants to discover things, he wants to uh, just be flexible and say, okay, now what's the weather today like? Okay, I wanted to go this direction, but it doesn't look really good. My weather app says, let's go this direction. So you hit the road and you just follow your heart. And, and is Switzerland well equipped for that kind of person, for this traveler? Yeah, there could always be more. Of course, there is, a, I would say, about 400 campgrounds all over in Switzerland. So Switzerland is a camping country. Um, it has from rural, really, back to nature, camping spots with great vistas to really well-equipped campgrounds. It has everything. And what about people who are coming from overseas to Switzerland? Well, we, we would love to have more of them. Uh, Switzerland is known also through the promotion of Swiss tourism. That people come over to Switzerland, they actually discover Switzerland by train, a big part of it. And in my opinion, that's a great thing to discover Switzerland, no question about that. But I also believe that there are many people, for example, from North America, from Australia, that are, that are using, that, that know camping from, from their own country, 
but they, they're not aware that this is a possibility to travel like this here in Switzerland as well. And actually that's where your experience comes from because you were involved in the camping and this industry over in Canada. Is it a similar situation there or do they do it better than us? <laughs> <laughs> I would say there it's just that's probably the number one way of, of experiencing the country. I mean, Canada has, uh, has just so much space and they have got thousands of campgrounds all over. And I think if, you, if we think about Canada, it's about being in nature. And to me, that's the best way to explore nature is you open the door and you're out. Uh, so it's, you're closer to nature. And Switzerland, I think, yeah, we can still do more. There could be more places, there could be more places you can just stay overnight even if it's not a campground, but it's an official and allowed place. Can, can you actually do that? Can you just rock up anywhere with a vehicle like this, put out your awning, pop up the, the top and, and you're set? Or are there rules and regulations, yeah. really? There are rules and regulations. Um, one thing is what are the rules, the other thing is what, what, what the customers or the people actually do. The regulations is it's, it's a little bit complicated. Um, camping, now we're camping because the chairs and the table is outside. If this wouldn't be outside and you're just taking a power nap, you're tired. It's parking. It's parking. <laughs> okay. It's parking, yes. And so how do we make that change then? Is that a barrier for people? No, it's not a barrier because there are many people that say, I, I don't want to just stay somewhere and just sleep there because I don't, I don't feel comfortable. Is it allowed or not? Question mark. For example, I. I prefer this way of traveling with my family as well. So last year we spent 49 nights in, in a VW like this. And my kids never want to camp wild. You're, they always want to stay in campgrounds. And your whole family can stay in a vehicle of this size? Yes. How many people? Four people. Four people? Yes, two kids, nine and eleven. Okay. Yeah. Well, it so... It brings the family together. <laughs> I bet it does. So are you trying to bring that whole canadian idea of vacationing to switzerland yeah you know, it's i think it's in my it's in my blood it's in my heart um just this flexible way of discovering things and to me what i'm more looking for is campgrounds that are a little bit more rural a little bit more out in the green in, in the bush where you have this nature feeling a bit more in my secret aspect, places you know, secret places and of course i know quite a few of them and we share it with our customers and and this is to me also this is this canadian feeling we're having here in switzerland as well and also uh, we'll, we'll talk about your business model now because really you're making this kind of travel more accessible to people because it's a big investment how, how much does one of these cost well <laughs> I could talk for, for a long time now. <laughs> basic um, price. Our, our, our vehicles are equipped, um, not just basic, they, they really have almost everything in there. So they start at about uh, 65,000 brand new and they go up to 90,000, 94,000, the best model. Yeah. And so people can rent these from City Peaks? Yes. And then how much does that yeah. cost? In the off season, on a weekly, on a weekly price, a vehicle like this is 890 Swiss francs a week but this is including more or less everything it's a 1050 kilometers in there it's kitchen, kitchen, uh, kitchen equipment it's preparation fee it's uh, it's the cleaning so this is your it's hotel and your hire car it's all in one I think that's the important <laughs> point it's not per person it's it's, uh, it's per vehicle and it's your car and it's your hotel so what's your business model then because obviously you have quite a few of these to to rent out and then what do you do with them at the end of the season yeah, the business model is, uh, number one, is renting premium camper vans, premium RVs, mm -hmm. but only in the compact class. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing is selling them at the end of the season because it's a strategic decision from us. We only want to rent every year brand new vehicles. So we're selling them at the end of the season. And then obviously buyers get a good deal at the end. Um, it's, it's all about having a good purchase price it's about having your costs con under control and of course it's about uh, the revenue during the season and at the end the selling price but it's a thin line here on front seat we've been talking a lot about in recent weeks about uh, scooter sharing car sharing yeah. is there such a thing as caravan sharing yeah. yes it's existing the sharing economy is of course uh, um, a big 
a big challenge for the entire tourism industry. Airbnb is uh, is is huge, and uh, all the hotels actually uh, feel it, feel this kind of industry as well. There are same platforms in in the RV industry as well. Um, Do you feel threatened by them? Of course, it's competition as well. But on the other hand, we also believe that, as we just mentioned before, it's your car and it's your hotel. And if this service is not perfect, you're probably not going to have a good vacation. So we believe that uh, the customers we're looking for, they're willing to pay maybe an extra buck uh, to really have a brand new vehicle that is uh, maintained by two top mecha uh, mechanics, that is perfectly clean, it's just, it's, it's all top and they know the base, the camper is there and it's going to be good. And technically it's going to be tip top as well, shall we go inside and have a look at what's on offer these sure. days? All right, well, why don't you start by explaining some of the comfort factors, because that's really the selling point of this kind of vehicle, isn't it? It is, yes. To me, the biggest point or the biggest plus in these compact cars is it's a space miracle. You've got everything on just a four, three or four square meters. For example, this seat here unfolds to double bed, or uh, you've got a complete kitchen here. Um, and if you want, yeah, I can make I can make coffee. Oh yes, please. <laughs> and uh, so it's very it's very convenient, very easy. And um, actually, you can also just push a button, and then you uh, have another double bed upstairs. In the roof. In the roof, yeah. So it actually suits for for people. What kind of people are using this vehicle? I mean, you mentioned bankers, but what kind of age group? Well, a little bit of everything, but I would say I would say it's a uh, average thirty-five to maybe sixty-five years old. But they're using it. And how does it differ from a caravan? This space. The big plus of this vehicle is really the access. You can go everywhere. Europe, in North America, for example, there I'd take a really big RV because you've got space. The roads are big and wide and the parking spots are no problem at all but here in Europe in Switzerland streets are narrow you want to go to you always somewhere in a village or in a, in a city and um, it, it's just narrow and and I think with these vehicles you have access right downtown and you can park in every parking lot and the European market is a big market then for this size of vehicle the European market is a big market for this size of the vehicle I, I mean we've got many customers Swiss customers that either say yes we want to explore Switzerland or yes we go north we go uh, towards Norway or we go down to France and they travel by this by this vehicle. And do you think we'll start to see more electric style vehicles of this size in the future do you think that could even change the industry again? Yes you know I, I believe so I mean uh, uh, it's to me as well I mean there's you should, should always have visions and to me it would be fantastic if one of these days uh, there would be an, an e an electric uh, camper with solar panels yeah, perhaps solar in there <laughs> panels and, but uh, it's still a long ways because uh, these uh, campers are or have the purpose to travel and there is just not enough electrical power or uh, hookups actually where you can charge your batteries right now in europe and, and do, do you think um where, where do you where will you be going on holiday this year do you think <laughs> You know, whenever friends are asking me that, <laughs> I always say, ask me two days ahead, because I think you're doing something wrong if you're just fixing your routing and then you're traveling right into the bad weather. So we're actually, we're having a routing in mind and then we look two days ahead or, or before. I was going to say, because you have to book a vehicle like this in advance. I mean, yeah. you can't be yeah. so yeah. free that you can yeah. just call up and take yeah. off. Yeah. You, can, you, can, you have to book the vehicle, but you don't have to fix the campground. You just go, you just go. You, we've traveled all over Europe in high season with the kids. No problem. We always find a place. And so where do you see the future here in Switzerland? Well, I believe there's, there are going to be more campgrounds. Uh, there's going to be, uh, it, it's an increasing industry. And, uh, but Swiss, Swiss, tour, Swiss tourism actually invented a great thing. It's a grand tour of Switzerland two or three years ago because touring is a worldwide trend. And so they, they realized we should do something. Switzerland is fantastic. And they invented the grand tour, which is a, mm -hmm. uh, a tour around Switzerland, 1600 kilometers. 
and uh, it's a fantastic uh, it's a fantastic route thing I can just recommend it yeah. okay well it sounds like our coffee's nearly ready uh, Thomas Yenta thank you very much indeed thank you very much mm. And that's it for the big picture. Coming up next is the very first edition of Executive Talk with Urs Gredig. And the uh, next hour is our last one for today. But you can follow us at cnnmoney.ch for all the content and interviews. And I wish you a very nice spring evening. Thank you for watching. I'm Martina Fuchs. Goodbye. Welcome to the CNN Money Switzerland weekend weather, starting with Saturday. And here are the comfort indexes for the Swiss cities. Let's have a look for Saturday in Europe. and the comfort indexes for some cities. Let's go to Sunday in Switzerland. And here are the comfort indexes. Discover the more attractive cities based on the weather. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need whenever, wherever you need it. On our website, cnnmoney.ch, or on your favorite social media platform. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. Business is always changing. Keep up with CNN Money. Maggie Lake is live in the heart of the world's economic epicenter, New York City, tracking all the action of the stock exchanges and the big business stories from around the world. Get top analysis of market movements and a daily breakdown of financial headlines. CNN Money with Maggie Lake. What drives Swiss leaders? What is the secret to their success? In The Newsmaker, we speak to successful CEOs, entrepreneurs, politicians, decision makers, opinion leaders, sports and entertainment personalities. We find out what makes them tick in a special long form interview that gets to the heart of who they are and where they are going. So pull up a chair and join us for The Newsmaker every weekday evening from 8 p.m. on CNN Money Switzerland. Follow us along the learning curve, our program dedicated to education in Switzerland, its future and the business behind it. Learning Curve with Amanda Kane on CNN Money Switzerland. CNN Money Switzerland is designed to flow through information. Our network provides a unique take on live worldwide financial news. We are not your common news outlet. Instead, we act as a global catalyst of interconnected information. Our live studio provides you with a detailed and sharp analysis, predicting what is yet to come. From the heart of Europe, watch CNN Money Switzerland. I've spent all of my career in the field. And I think that informs who I want to talk to, but more importantly, who wants to and who accepts 
to talk to me. And I hope that what I bring to the table is a rigorous search for the truth and a rigorous determination and an effort to hold power accountable. Aman Paul. This hour, we are launching our very first executive talk. This new weekly segment takes a closer look at the business and opinion leaders of Switzerland and what makes them tick. We start off with one of the most successful and at the same time controversial Swiss managers of the recent past, Josef Ackermann. And we ask him about the greediness of some bankers leading up to the financial crisis. We were uh, too short-term driven. Uh, and uh, that was one of, the, one of the issues that, you know, you created, generated volume, got a good compensation, and then a few years later, you have discovered that some of these deals were actually bad deals and, and, and were backfiring. While it's been a bumpy road for markets, we're seeing a golden streak this earnings season. So what's behind the success? And will the streak continue? Good evening. I am Ana Maria Montero, and you are watching Executive Talk here on the Swiss Pulse. with a look at those headlines making news here in Switzerland and around the world. Andy Rees, a Swiss businessman who owned the BMC racing cycling team and a young boy soccer club, has died at age 75. His death comes with the young boys close to winning its first Swiss league title in 32 years. Andy Rees's biggest achievement as an entrepreneur is co-founding the hearing aid company Phonak, today's Sonova. Sonova is one of the world's leaders in this industry. And in a statement, Robert Spurdy, chairman of Sonova, said that Sonova has not only lost a great friend with tremendous foresight and an extraordinarily creative spirit, but also a multi-talented and passionate entrepreneur who left a distinctive mark. Meanwhile, it seems Switzerland is paying more and more to stay healthy. The Federal Statistical Office reports that just over 80 billion Swiss francs were spent in 2016, a nearly 4% increase over the previous year. Similar increases can be expected in the next two years, according to the Kauf Swiss e Economic Institute. The forecast attributes these growth rates to political measures and rising salaries. Meanwhile, private health spending is also on the rise, with health-related costs accounting for 15% of household budgets versus 10% in 1993. Takeda has offered to buy drug maker Shire for $60 billion. That's according to Reuters. This would officially kick off what would be one of the biggest corporate takeovers ever by a Japanese company. The deal would give Takeda, Japan's biggest drug maker, a broader global reach and key treatments that are in the late stages of testing. The possible offer comes after Shire agreed on Monday to sell its cancer unit to Francis Servier for $2.4 billion. Shire's shares listed in London surged as much as 7.6% after the report, and Takeda has so far declined to comment. The world's debt pile has ballooned to a record $164 trillion, a trend that could make it harder for countries to respond to the next recession and pay off debt if financing conditions tighten, the IMF said. Global public and private debt swelled to 225% of global GDP in 2016. The global debt burden clouded the IMF's otherwise upbeat outlook on the world economy, which is in its strongest upswing since 2011. Speaking earlier today, IMF head Christine Lagarde addressed the meeting and cautioned that escalation of trade wars poses a real risk to the world economy. We'll have much more on that for you later on in the program. But coming up, 
It is our very first executive talk, and this is where our editor-in-chief, Urt Gredig, has rare access to Switzerland's A-list business leaders and influencers. And it will see him going behind the headlines and the hype to find out what really motivates and shapes these men and women. The first guest tonight is Josef Ackermann, who has carved a global reputation in the banking industry. CNN Money Switzerland weather. We start with the webcam of the day. Here is an overview of the values recorded in the last hours. And now the map of Swiss warnings. Let's have a look to the forecast for this afternoon. for tomorrow. Here is an overview for the next days in German-speaking Switzerland. In Western Switzerland. And south of the Alps. Thanks for following us. Welcome back now to the Executive Talk, our new weekly format where every Thursday our editor-in-chief Urs Gredig has an in-depth one-to-one with the CEOs, chairmen and chairwomen of Switzerland. We start with someone who has been lauded as one of the world's top bankers. Yet, at the same time, he has also been described as one of the most dangerous ones. And that's because of his excessive profit targets and some controversial comments during the European debt crisis. Josef Ackermann, former head of the Deutsche Bank and current chairman of the Bank of Cyprus, is our first guest in the executive talk. Welcome to the executive talk. You turned 70 uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, however, you're, you're as busy as always. You're still working. Uh, you're still the chairman of the Bank of Cyprus, for example. Are you one of those managers who could just not stop working, who can't let go? I hope not, because uh, I really want to slow down a little bit. And I'm, I'm only doing things which uh, I like to do. So that's such a big difference already. But uh, no, I'm, I want to do other things as well, giving back things to the younger people. So I'm like, lecturing a little bit more and, you know, having seminars, workshops with younger people, with also more uh, senior people. Uh, we will have a chairman's uh, workshop uh, in a few weeks' time where we talk about experiences and so So things like that. Uh, but uh, completely, you know, retire and, and to just play golf, that's probably not, not the right thing for me. Why is that? Because a lot of people say that. I couldn't go from a, a very busy career to completely nothing. Uh, is that a kind of a fear of, of, of getting old, getting rusty? What, what is it exactly? It's, it's more a fear of, of getting old. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a, a normal intellectual curiosity in you. And uh, traveling, meeting interesting people, hearing a bit more what's going on than what you read in the media. And, and that is really fascinating. I don't need, uh, because I always said, if you define your, or your role on, on, uh, on what you are doing, the function you are, you are having, then, then you're making a mistake. Because one day you will not sit at the head table because you're just not chairman or CEO of a big company anymore. Uh, so that would be wrong. But, but to be involved, to get the feeling I'm still contributing, to, to stand, get up in the morning and to, to do something, to contribute something, 
maybe also to, to society at large, uh, uh, that is still fascinating. And if you, if you give that up, I think you are getting old and, and you are losing interest. And I've seen so many people who either came back from retirement because they felt that, you know, just playing golf or, or something else. Because they were but, playing but second role, they wanted to be... In, oh. they, they, they wanted to come back. Or, or people who didn't do that, and then they really lost interest and got old and slow and somehow... And, and many of them even even uh, sick after a while. So I think it's good to, to keep you busy and to keep you somewhat interested. I, I would more focusing on, on, on curiosity than on, uh, on, on anything else. Is it hard getting older? Also as a businessman, as a manager, do you feel, uh, ah, 20 years ago I would, have, I would have done that differently, I'll bet? Well, I must say when I was probably 20 or 30 and probably the same for you, people around 60 were old people, you know, they, they hardly did any sport, I mean, you haven't seen them on the ski, in ski resorts and so Today people at the age of 18, 90 are traveling, are are active, are actually in good shape. So, no, physically I, or mentally, I don't feel getting old at all, to be honest. As long as you're healthy, I mean, that's, that's always a precondition. There are, uh, there are generations, of course, there are generations of bankers as well. And you belong to a generation of bankers who, 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 who grew up in their professional life in, in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, would you consider yourself an, an old school, old fashioned banker as well? Well, it's a good question, actually. I mean, you know, when, when the whole capital market business started, uh, so in the, in the 90s, uh, uh, when compensation uh, changed, uh, even in, in Europe, uh, when we got more involved in, in trading activities, uh, probably the old-fashioned bank would say this was a bad turn and it was not, it's not old traditional banking anymore. On the other hand, uh, you know, disintermediation, so mm -hmm. to find ways how investors can invest in, in companies uh, via the capital market has really changed life completely. And, and so in that sense, we are a little bit less old fashioned, uh, probably more technology driven, more also to some extent trading driven, more investment banking driven. That is probably different, but you know, who talked about derivatives 30 years ago? And, and when I got the mandate to build up the derivatives business at an old Swiss bank, people said, oh, that's very bad and, and you know, that's the end of, of your career. And I did so, and actually today this is a, almost a traditional product. So things have changed dramatically. And w when you speak about investment banking, I mean, you, w when we hear the name Ackermann, we think of investment banking because it's, it's, it's a business you, 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 uh, you, you were always on, on top of uh, for the Deutsche Bank. You, you, you pretty much invented investment banking. You made it, I think, the third biggest investment bank in the world. Now that you see banks going the other way around again and maybe like lowering their investment banking. Does that hurt you in a way? Do, we, do you understand these banks as, as UBS, Credit Suisse, for example, going the other way around? No, it doesn't hurt me. It's just a result of, of regulatory changes primarily. Uh, you know, if, if you need uh, to allocate more capital to certain businesses, and I'm primarily talking about trading uh, businesses, uh, of course the return on equity is, is shrinking and that uh, changes the business model. On top of that, uh, in the financial crisis, uh, a lot of blame was put on this kind of activities. Uh, probably not completely right, because a lot of people contributed to what has happened in 2009. Uh, I mean, central made. banks and, 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 and politicians and, and many others, investors who were greedy for higher yields and many other things. But banks, of course, uh, were the scapegoat. And, and that changed also a little bit behavior. And, and to some extent, I understand that. And I was part of probably the first one uh, at the uh, press club in, in Washington uh, when I was chairman of the International Institute of, uh, Institute of International Finance, who said, we have to change. We, we need a different culture. Compensation has to be rediscussed and many other things. So in that sense, uh, I think we have seen that we have been too excessive in many ways and changed that. But I would also say that investment banking activities are not dying because uh, the more you have capital market activities, the more you have disintermediation, the more you need investment banks. And I think it would be a huge mistake to, to shrink that business to, to zero. And, and those who stay the course will be the winners. And you see the US banks are now completely taking over that business. 
when you say it had to, a lot to do with the image of, of the bankers as well and, and, and uh, the talks of salaries and, and uh, that hunt for, for high yields, of course. Um, would you say that uh, after, after maybe 20 years, 15 years, also after the financial crisis, would you admit yourself that, yes, there has been, a, as you say yourself, that, that there has been exaggerated behaviour, uh, the bankers are in a way you know, uh, maybe responsible for that image as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, it was always difficult to explain banking products. Um, even when I started in the 70s, we were somehow criticized for not being transparent, not having, you know, it's, it's not a consumer good, it's not a, a car or a, or a chocolate uh, you can explain, not something everybody you can likes touch, it, you can, you can relate uh, to or, it. Or in compensation, a, a, you know, a soccer star or, or a, a pop star who entertains people. We are not entertaining people. And, and in that sense, uh, it's a bit more difficult to explain and to defend. That was always the case. But yes, I think we were uh, too short-term driven. Um, and uh, that was one of, the, one of the issues, that you, know, you created, generated volume, got a good compensation, and then a few years later, you have discovered that some of these deals were actually bad deals and, and, and were backfiring. And, and we changed that, of course, with clawbacks and with deferred payments and things like that. But I, I would fully agree that the culture in, in parts of banking, you know, I always have to stress 90% of the bankers have never been driven by, by greed at all. Uh, but of course, there were some um, who exaggerated that and, 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 and that was a mistake. Yeah. Were you one of those? No, I, I don't think I was one of them, but, but uh, did I play uh, uh, that role as well? Yes, because, uh, you know, it's always important to remember a little bit how the spirit was at the time. Uh, in, in 96, I, got, I fired a team who was actually a well-known global investment banking team because I didn't like the formula and I didn't like the money they made. Um, for themselves, but actually made a loss for the bank. That's the way it was structured. And I said, that's not uh, what I'm going to support, and we changed that. And the funny thing was that the media didn't criticize those who left, or didn't criticize, or didn't applaud me for being disciplined and finally changing the culture. No, I was criticized for losing the best people. So in, in that so it sense- It was almost the opposite. It's of, the opposite. Of so, so, you know, people uh, were, uh, there was a different hype, and, and it's always fair a little bit to remind people that, yes, it is true, there were exaggerations, but it was also the spirit of the time was different, and, and, and you were criticized for not being on top of the league table, of not having a high return on equity, and many things like that. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, a bit, um, it's a bit interesting. When in 2008, just before the crisis, there was a major key analyst who said at the time, Deutsche Bank is under leveraged and overcapitalized. I mean, no one would say that today. It's the, it was then the other way around. But just to show you had to meet also expectations of which were completely different from today's uh, expectations. Uh, it was very interesting that you talked about soccer stars and something people can relate to. Uh, the Champions League is in full swing. We see players playing there uh, who cost more than $200 million, uh, yeah. dollars, uh, Swiss francs, whatever you want. Um, they're probably gaining more than, than, than all of the top bankers maybe combined as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Does that ever strike you as well, that uh, people kind of adore football players who get a lot of money, but if a banker, if a manager gets a lot of money, and you've, you've encountered that yourself, uh, that they get criticised, uh, did that ever, ever bother you or even hurt you? Well, it, it bothered me in, in a sense that, you know, even, even well-known economists actually even a Nobel Prize winner at the time said they have an entertainment value, so they, they deserve more money. But managers, everybody can do that. And I would say that is a completely wrong statement because uh, managers make a difference. Those who went through the financial crisis without uh, taxpayer support, uh, uh, with you know, somewhat uh, limited losses, as they Deutsche Bank did. As, as we yeah. did, yeah. Obviously, we did a better job than others who had to be bailed out uh, with taxpayers' money for, for hundreds of billions. And, and, and but if people say everybody can do that and, and there's no differentiation, then where, where is actually the justification for higher compensation? And, and I just uh, disagree a little bit on that. So in that sense, whether you know Ronaldo makes 
I don't know how many times more than I do, I have no problem with that. But where I have a problem, if people say, well, he's overpaid because he, he's not doing a good job or, or he's not doing a better job than, than others who, who are maybe even better paid. So in that sense, I think I always try to explain um, that uh, good people should also be well paid. When it comes to salary, how much is too much? Where would Joseph Ackerman put the line between normal and obscene? That's to come in part two of Executive Talk. Stay tuned. Connect the world with Becky Anderson. It all starts here. Changing, fighting, creating connecting that's why we're here we live here we work here we're from here and we'll go wherever the story takes us i'm becky anderson in tehran we are in jerusalem real news that shapes our world exploring not just what's going on but why i just want to press you on one further point getting perspective on this region from this region places that many of us know but few of us get to see Observing countries on the move, still rooted in tradition. It all starts here, and that's why we're here, bringing you the world from our Middle Eastern hub. Connect the world with Becky Anderson. Excuse me, miss, you dropped this. No, it's just a penny. Just a penny? Just a penny? It all begins with the humble penny. Whether writing your first cheque or cashing big cheques. To those at the top, making their mark, closing deals round the clock. On Quest Means Business, we know every penny has power. And it's not how many you have. It's what you do with them that counts. That's the marvel of money. Quest means business. What a profitable hour. drives the Swiss business world? What makes the economy tick? And how do companies react to the ever-changing challenges of the markets? We've got our finger on the Swiss pulse. We'll bring you the ups and downs, the bulls and bears of the world of business, always asking what it means for you. The Swiss pulse, weekdays from 6 to 9 p.m. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need whenever you need it. Get the latest Swiss business and financial information on TV or on the go through our website, cnnmoney.ch, or through your favorite social media. The best Swiss business news, whenever and wherever you need it. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. Welcome back to the Executive Talk. He's arguably the most successful banker this country has ever produced. He's been president of the Schweizerische Kreditanstalt, chairman of Deutsche Bank, and he's held numerous board positions during his long career, as well as regularly advising politicians and policymakers all over the world. And yet, Josef Ackermann always had to fight against the reputation of being a manager who only has his profits and earnings in mind. He once famously said that Germany is the only country where those who are successful and create value are put on trial for their troubles. What does he say now about his divisive reputation? Well, here's part two of our executive talk.
did you ever have a moment where you said, okay, uh, where can I put a number where there's really a limit for compensation? Yeah. I mean, uh, more than 50, more than 10, where you say, now it's getting obscene. It was actually quite interesting. When I was chairman of this uh, uh, you know, global banks and, and insurance association for, for almost 10 years, after the financial crisis, I suggested that we put in a cap on compensation. And uh, only hours later, I got phone calls from US lawyers saying, don't do that because this violates antitrust uh, legislation. And, and uh, so I've seen, you know, actually we are operating in a market. If someone makes more money and can pay better, he gets probably better people. I mean, in, absolutely uh, accepted in, in, in football. You know, when you, when you are paying the Champions League, you get a lot of revenues uh, and you are allowed to uh, buy better people, which, which of course makes you more successful going forward. Whereas in, I think in the National Hockey League in the US, it's different that the weaker players can first get the good players, exactly. which is actually yeah. quite, quite a fair way. they have way a cap of, as well, so they can't have a cap as well. So it's actually a fair way of doing yeah. it. Uh, uh, you know, if, if you just get richer and, and you buy better people, you get richer and better and more successful. This is so, at the end, getting a bit boring because you have only a few clubs who are really uh, winning everything, and that's a bit the case. Speaking of boring, and, 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 and I realise that I ask these questions as well, you get these questions a lot. You, you have to justify a lot. And, and, and you were a very divisive figure. I mean, uh, you were the European Banker of the Year 2010, so a highly respected, uh, very powerful banker. At the same time, uh, you were called the, the most dangerous banker in Europe, uh, someone who, who's only after profit. I mean, the, 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 let's say the, 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 the general public was always very divided. How did you deal with that? Did that ever get to you personally that say, oh, they, they, they don't know me, however they judge me? Well, when, when I became CEO of Deutsche Bank, the, the former head of the Bundesbank, Carlo Dupöl, uh, who lived in the same building, actually told me this following. From now on, you will, be two, you will have two different identities. One is the identity uh, which you know, your friends know and your family, and please stay that way. But you will also be a person who is a symbol for, for something people don't like. Capitalism, banking, finance, and so on. And, and I always separated these two things. I read, you know, many of the attacks are not on me so personally. They are more uh, on me as a symbol of something. And I must say, you know, I'm not critical of media, but uh, sometimes I really wondered a bit what the impact of media is. Because if you walk around and, and when we made uh, a service, uh, the, the result was always completely different. A lot of support uh, up to day uh, uh, that happens. And so, so people want to have autographs and pictures and so. So in that, I would not overestimate that either, but, but it shows there are, there are different uh, uh, views. But, you know, there's uh, also a lesson. If you can't stand the heat, don't, don't mm -hmm. become a, a cook. And, and, and if you are CEO, especially, especially of Deutsche Bank, which is a... a, a Really different animal because it it carries the, the name of the country. And Everybody, you were the first non-German, and, and the first non-German in in an environment which is pretty nationalistic in a sense. You know, they would like to have someone from their own country on top of that. Uh, and and we, we challenged a lot of things. We we challenged uh, you know to become more profitable. We get into into a more global bank, uh, uh, selling some of the industrial assets because uh, we wanted to. Uh, free up market forces and, and many things like that, which were not uh, liked. I mean, we did restructurings. Uh, when I started, uh, we did use cost uh, by about six billion um, in, in the first two years. So, I mean, there were a lot of things people were uh, not so used to. At. Mm -hmm. But at the end, when we were then quite successful, also very profitable, uh, a lot of people were very proud, and even, even our own staff was very proud. So, in, in that sense, uh, you know, sometimes just stay the course. And, and you may get uh, more recognition later on and, and, and what, what happens in the meantime, you, you just stay away. What I would just like to add one point. It needs a family, a wife and children who can live with that because that is the more critical part than, than you know, what, what you see yourself. Because you were really sometimes in the line of fire. Of course, there was, the, there was that uh, famous picture during the Mannesmann trial with the victory sign. There were some, some, some quotes and citations and what you said about Greece, for example. So, uh, when you were in the line of fire like this, did you ever tell yourself, oh, why did I just do that? Why did I just say that? 
Well, I mean, there are certainly moments where you, where you say, you know, why do I need that? Uh, uh, on the other hand, this is only a small part of it. And, and uh, you know, today a lot of people probably talk about fake news because many of these news have not been um, described correctly. I mean, they were completely different. For instance, victory sign, everybody knows that. Uh, the return on equity of 25% pre-tax, which was criticized for decades still in, in Germany. You know, if I go to other parts of the world, they, they, they just smile and say, well, that's a minimum uh, a requirement. And, and so, you know, you, you, are, you are living in different, in different worlds. I always said one thing that's very important. Um, it is easy to please the people uh, in a specific country. I mean, you would say, we are, you know, creating many jobs. We are paying investment bankers not as much as they do in, in other parts of the world. Uh, of course, you are lending a lot of money and so on. And all of that, and people probably love that. Then you, but then of course the investors, community, shareholders, analysts would would criticize you for for not doing what you are paid for. So I always said, you know, I'm not I'm not playing this dual role because, uh, you know, analysts read what you say. In, in public statements uh, in, in Germany or in other parts, and, and vice versa. So I always say, be authentic. Uh, just say what you think is right. And, and I always did that. Now, you know, sometimes uh, people... It worked and sometimes it didn't. Uh, yeah, well, maybe, maybe uh, people don't like it. I mean, when I said we, we, we don't want to have uh, taxpayers' money, by the way, we made uh, an opinion poll then, 70% of Germans found that a very good answer. The politicians were very happy, because, uh, some of them at least, because they, you know, they said this is lack of solidarity to other banks. Oh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not paid for being, you know, showing solidarity with other banks. I'm, I'm paid for running my bank the best way I can do. What do you make of politicians who, who are running now uh, not only companies but, but countries? When, uh, when Donald Trump was elected, you said it's, it's an interesting experiment because uh, you were highly interested in politics as well. You wanted to become a politician, I think, in the first, uh, while, yeah. in early years. Yeah. What do you make of the experiment Trump so far? Well, I, you know, what, what I said at the time is, if you have the head of one of the largest uh, uh, oil companies, if you have uh, people uh, from Goldman Sachs, from mm. like in Wilbur Ross and so bring and, and Trump himself, you have a completely different uh, expertise around the table. Is that an expertise which is beneficial for running a country, uh, contrary to just politicians who grew up domestically and have not had the same network globally. And I still think that's an open question and, and, and might change the way uh, governments are, are composed later on. Um, I still think that, uh, you know, uh, certainly the style and the methods is very unorthodox. And, and uh, I would not, I I'm not very happy about this twittering and, and all of that. But, but uh, on the other hand, you see that by being very blunt, asking for a maximum and then compromising on somewhat lower level has been actually quite effective in many ways. Uh, I'm not, you know, as an economist, of course, I'm, I'm in favor of free trade, but um, as Wilbur Ross was vice chairman of Bank of Cyprus and, and we worked together for several years, I know what he means. He's, he's for free trade, but he wants to have fair trade and more balanced trade. And the, the, the question is really, do they achieve that without provoking too many retaliations? And, and whether this is uh, long term in the interest not only of the United States, but of the global economy. Because if you get all these conflicts with China and now with Russia, with, with the EU and so, this is not actually the world I would like to, well, quote unquote, uh, pass on to, to, to children, to our children. So in that sense, uh, I hope that these are just attempts to, to get more out of it for, for the United States. But at the end, you find a, back to the way of, of globalization, of respecting each other, respecting each other's values, and also to have a, a, a prosperous future. And, and, and that is, for me, still a bit an open question. Uh, 
uh, speaking of passing on to, to the next generations, you said it yourself in, in the beginning of this interview that you want to pass on to the next generation what you've learned. Uh, you, 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 you started teaching again or, or being involved with, with that. Uh, what would be the legacy you want to give them if you have one, one advice to, to young people starting now or maybe young bankers as well? What is the one thing you've learned from your career that you want to pass on, that you want to... I think in, in, a, in, a, in a global world, you have to be interested in, in a lot of cultures and, and this curiosity about knowing more and, and actually loving other cultures, embracing other cultures, that is so fantastic. And, you know, when, and I had a month of meeting with Yang Zeming, the former president of China. He really impressed me. He quoted Shakespeare, Hamlet, when he greeted me in English. And he quoted Goethe's Faust in German at the end. And I must say, I said to myself, I couldn't say one sentence, one proverb in Chinese. In, in Chinese. Yeah. And, 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 and that's a big problem, actually. We, we don't understand Chinese history. We don't understand Chinese culture. We don't understand their language. I mean, most of us. And, and they know much more about us. And I think if you, are, if you want to be successful in business going forward, especially in, in the global world, you have to understand how other people think, to show empathy to, to what is going on. And I think that is, that is the, the key message. I would. That is kind of a cultural advice. I, I, I read somewhere, you're getting quite philosophical, uh, uh, also maybe with age or so, but uh, one question you're very interested in is why does someone uh, get successful or has success with that, what he does, and the other one who's just sitting next to it, who did the same thing, maybe the same education, doesn't have success? Yeah, that's, uh, I, mean, I always said, you know, I will never write a biography, uh, but if I ever wrote the book, I would write the book, write the book, why some people, you know, brilliant students end up somewhere in the middle. Uh, you know, less brilliant people are suddenly on the top. And I think there are a few criteria. One very important one is, is self-confidence, you know. To be able to take risks because you know either I have, I'm confident I can do it, or if I fail, I can always go back. So I, I'm always saying, you know, I grew up on the countryside. I always felt that my family, my friends would support me even if I fail. And, and I think that gives you a lot of, uh, of confidence. Secondly, uh, of course, you need luck, you, but also hardworking. And I think this multicultural understanding and, and that people uh, help you, that your team likes to work with you, so you are a team player, but, you know, uh, not, not running a company as a team, but, but having a team supporting you uh, as, as a CEO. And, and I think it's also very important uh, uh, to, be, to have this intellectual curiosity, to, to have this education permanent that you constantly try to, to learn what is changing, uh, to, to, to keep up with that. I mean, you know, who, who understood um, emails or, 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 or many other things uh, uh, 20 or 30 years ago? I mean, and, and, and then to, to learn that and to get involved, uh, I think it's a, another very important. But self-confidence, I would say, is a very important um, part of it. Final question. When you were a little boy, you got a note from your father who was the doctor in, 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 in the place yeah. you lived, yeah. uh, by, by, by Wieland, I think it was, yeah. which said, and I paraphrase it a bit, uh, uh, you only find your own happiness through other people's happiness. When you look back at your life, at your career, did you achieve that? I, I tried. I, I, I'm not a very childish person. I must say I, I, I try to help other people to excel. And I'm still doing it. I'm, I'm, supporting uh, sports people, uh, you know, I was an athlete, but I was not uh, such a good athlete. And, and I, I'm helping people to get better. Uh, musicians, I'm supporting many other things. Yes, I'm, I'm, I, I feel if, I, if people are, are doing a good job, are happy, are, are enjoying what they are doing, um, that is something which makes me uh, also uh, somewhat happy and, and, and maybe it's a bit philosophical, but, but also gives me joy. Uh, for myself. And you still have that paper with you every day, is that Every day, I have it in my pocket, yeah. Josef Alkerman, thank you very much. It was a pleasure, thank you.
Since the founding of the Red Cross in 1863, the city of Geneva has a long tradition of hosting international organizations. In our program, International Geneva, we'll be exploring issues of international cooperation, humanitarian assistance and human rights, and talk to international players about the challenges and solutions to global problems. International Geneva with Martina Fuchs on CNN Money Switzerland. Shanghai, the old-fashioned way. CNN Business Traveler in China. By the end of the next decade, the largest aviation market in the world. Are you ready for that? Businesses are spreading their wings. China Eastern, keeping the Chinese sky safe. <laughs> New ways to earn miles. Are you still a mileage geek? Yes, always. And bridging culture gaps. Don't ask. On the next CNN Business Traveler. somebody to, to tell you their story, it's it's something I take really seriously. It's not something you can just parachute in and ask somebody to open their heart to you. To peel away the layers, to get to the heart of the person who you're telling a story about. France will never give up against the terrorists. And delve beneath the, the surface of what's happening. You can hear their story and you're going to do their story justice. Thank you. you have to show yourself to Thank them. You. So right now they're hovering pretty low over this area that, that's uh, extensively flooded. CNN's the right place to tell their story. Business is always changing. Keep up with CNN Money. Maggie Lake is live in the heart of the world's economic epicenter, New York City, tracking all the action of the stock exchanges and the big business stories from around the world. Get top analysis of market movements and a daily breakdown of financial headlines. CNN Money with Maggie Lake. The Swiss Pulse delivers you the most important global and Swiss business and financial news, connecting Switzerland to the world. Tune in every weekday from 6 p.m. or find us on the go on our website or social media platforms. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need whenever, wherever you need it. Get the latest Swiss business and financial information on TV, on our website, cnnmoney.ch, or on your favorite social media platform. The best Swiss business news whenever and wherever you need it. Only from CNN Money Switzerland. All right, welcome back to the Swiss Pulse. It's been a strong showing for Swiss companies this earnings season, providing a bit of much needed security in the backdrop of a few bumpy months for markets. Earlier, I spoke to Alistair McCaig, Director of Investment Management at Fern Wealth, to find out if this golden streak will take us into the second half of the year. Yes, uh, I, I think it's worth noting that there's, um, with uh, all these companies just being mentioned, mm. uh, changes at the top in the recent years um, have. Uh, uh, seen a, a while for the companies to absorb these changes, structural uh, rebalancing of uh, product bases, um, and that's okay. taken a while for the markets to absorb. It's taken a while. These turnarounds never happen quickly. Yeah. A little bit like the oil tanker analogy. It takes a while for that oil tanker to turn around. Yeah. Uh, ABB have um, managed to reorganise themselves a little bit. Yeah. Um, the market like what they see. Um, and they've performed well. Um, I think as far as the, the structural business is you, concerned... You seem though, concerned, though. Are you, are you optimistic? I, I, don't, I don't sense a lot of optimism here. <laughs> all right, there's a smile. Let's see what's... I, uh, <laughs> I think in all of the instances here, um, the, the Swiss markets and many of these Swiss companies, they have a, a real dependence, uh, intrinsic dependence, on the Swiss franc currency. A lot of the business is yeah. done overseas. Sure. And there is that question mark that, that hangs over many of the, the operations as to how the Swiss franc is going to perform. Right. The FTSE, very much similar uh, beast in so much as many of those companies derive their, their uh, income stream from outside the country. So that is yeah. always a consideration, maybe not necessarily a concern. Okay. All right. Well, if I mean, if we look at them, they're all from different sectors. We've got ABB, we've got Nestle, Solcer, for example, you know, the ones we mentioned yes. earlier. I mean, what is their common denominator? 
Well, Behind we, the success, I mean. Yeah. Yes, I, I think um, share, share price reaction has maybe been muted um, this year across the board in equities anyway, yeah. as the global equity traders and investors become a little bit more accustomed to the, um, the volatility that's moved back into the market. Right. So maybe some of the reactions that we are seeing today in these shares aren't as much as we would have seen in years gone by, even last year for that matter. Um, so I think um, ABB specifically, I think that's good. I think when we look at, say, Nestle, mm -hmm. um, they uh, are refocusing a little bit as well with their, where their yeah. product range, mm -hmm. um, and they're moving into waters, a particularly important area, we think, in the long term. Um, and again, reorganisation of the company. Um, I think um, Salsa, because of the oil market, um, it's obviously feeling the benefits of higher oil prices there, and I guess a bit more enthusiasm as far as the, uh, the commodity sector is concerned. Um, and we haven't seen the, the prevalence of the Saudis wanting to drive that price down as much, but with the uncertainties that are hang over Russia and the sanctions, not just with their own uh, member, but others in that area too, it does have quite a big question mark hanging over the area. And what about Tom's, uh, Tom's, Trump's tax reform? <clears throat> Do you think... Is this also a result? Are we finally feeling the effects of this? We, we, we've seen the effects of this um, most clearly being represented in technology sector. I think uh, the pharmaceutical sector has also... There are a number of driving factors that are going on there, and I think uh, today's news flow about Shire Pharmaceuticals and the takeover, potential mm -hmm. takeover by Takeda is a, a replication of this. Novartis have also stated that they're in the market still for acquisitions up to $10 billion. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more M&A activity in that area and the tax, tax reforms in America will give many of the, the US companies a bit more flexibility on what they can do and it should ensure that we see a continuation of mergers and acquisitions in that arena. All right, if we go back a minute to the share prices, we're talking a little bit about the equity prices, so ABB up, Novartis down, I mean, what is your feeling? Do you think investors were surprised? <clears throat> um, I think, again... Do they expect I, I, more, maybe, as you were saying? Or? Yeah, I think we've seen a, a slightly dampened enthusiasm in this reporting sector. Yeah. I know that the, the Swiss market's a bit smaller. If we look, broaden it out more globally, S&P 500, which is a much bigger sector, mm. if we use that as a, a sort of barometer of expectations and market reactions, mm. um, I think we've seen that, that investors and traders are looking for quite a lot from these companies, and they're a little bit more easily disappointed or there's a lack of enthusiasm in comparison to yesteryears. And we are maybe just beginning to see the expectations dampen down a little bit as, as, as we fear about uh, continuation of this. Well, so we're not seeing a necessarily a relief rally. That would be a bit of an exaggeration is what I'm getting. No, I think um, if, if we look at the broader markets and you touched on... on, on Trump's tax reforms and the way that the markets have been. We obviously saw a, a big correction uh, at the tail end of January, beginning of February. Mm -hmm. I think it's taken the markets a little while to absorb that and take that on board. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of confusion brought to the, to the table by the political, mm -hmm. geopolitical confusion and uh, chaos that's mm -hmm. materialising. And I think as time ticks on, the markets and the, 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 the investment community are beginning to take on board that when Trump sends out a tweet, it's right. to his internal voting populace as opposed to more the global community and his, uh, necessarily his, his bargaining position. So you think that these, uh, pol these potential, as you say, uh, geopolitical risks, are they high? I mean, are you concerned? Um, I think it's dampening down, and the reason is that we're becoming more accustomed to it. It's taken us a little while to become accustomed <laughs> we're, to... We're accustomed to the midnight tweets, and et cetera, yeah. I, I think if you look at tw uh, Twitter, everybody is waiting for, for President Trump's first tweet of the day yeah. to see where the land lies. And yeah. I think it's worth noting when, when we looked at, say, um, trade wars with, with uh, um, China, um, the tweets changed... He changed his mentality within a 15-minute time frame. When it came to uh, a couple of weeks later mm -hmm. uh, and we were looking at uh, drugs, he changed his mindset within a few hours. So the timeline's at least being stretched somewhat. Markets aren't reacting quite as aggressively as they were. We're very much of the opinion that when you look behind the, the, the in, instant chaos and you look 
further, as it were, take a right. step back and look at the bigger picture. It's... Many companies are still managing to perform well. Yeah. Um, there is going to be a benefit as far as cash flow is concerned from the, the tax reforms. Yeah. Um, and that will emanate on the European arena. The European Central Bank still remains pretty firmly focused on its strategy uh, looking at reducing the quantitative easing and then ultimately looking to raise rates. And that's obviously a central bank that has confidence in the market. So mm -hmm. it is still moving in the right direction. Companies, are, corporate data is still good. Economic data is still good. Mm -hmm. It's just the, the instant short-term confusion that we're seeing, frothiness, if you will. Yes, the chaos, the first uh, layer of chaos you have to get through in order to really... Yeah. Um, of course, now it, to finish up, you know, it's the, the meetings, the spring meetings at the IMF. And uh, mm -hmm. Christine Lagarde, for example, seems to be feeling positive about the growth, but still very concerned about the debt, and these, these yeah. crazy numbers in the trillions. What yeah. is your feeling? Well, rightly so. Um, there's been a lot of debt created in order for the central banks to, to prop up equity markets, bond markets as well. Mm -hmm. I think as far as uh, the interest rates are concerned uh, yeah. globally, that maybe took um, a bit of a, a dampener earlier on in the week when we saw inflation figures come in a little bit lower than expected. Mm -hmm. And that maybe just eases back expectations on rate rises. Um, and I think as far as growth is concerned, and, and Christine Lagarde was pointing to, yes, mm -hmm. there is the big issue that needs to be tackled in due course about reducing this debt and ultimately unwinding it. Do you feel that it's like a long-term issue? Very much a long-term okay, issue. It's not, not a short, it's not a short-term concern? Is it more a <clears> long-term <throat> concern? No, I think it's, in fairness, it's the IMS job to, to point these things out. Um, and, and I think we're all conscious of them. Um, and I don't think it really changes our, our mentality as far as the markets are concerned in the short term. Um, it is an issue that will need to be tackled. But right here, right now, it's not, not, it's not something that's going to prevent the markets from ultimately regaining that momentum and ultimately heading higher. And do you think we'll see a repeat of these quarter one results? I think the, the, do you the think companies. Is going to a trend for the rest of the year, do you think? Or? I, I think companies have performed pretty well so far to date that, that we've seen. Um, here in Switzerland, broadly speaking, so far, early yeah. days. In the US as well, I think companies have come in quite well. Um, and I think I, I expect that to be maintained over the course of this reporting season. Some of the most heated moments in sports sometimes take place on the sidelines or out of play when players are frustrated by referee calls in the game. Earlier, I asked Matt Layton how to deal with those misbehaving players. Well, it's obviously, we're human. We're not computers. We all have amazing emotions. And when they're under stress, being watched by millions of people, it's not easy. Uh, the reason I'm talking about this today is the, uh, the Valley Football Association. In the low leagues, they're publishing what are the penalties for being naughty. So effectively, if you are applauding at a referee, clearly sarcastically, you have a one-match ban. If you're a bit more rude, insulting his judgment, that's a two-match ban. If you insult his mother, or incredibly uh, disagreeably rude. That's a three-match ban. And it goes up if you show him your bum, which apparently some people do, <laughs> it's a six-match ban. So imagine the case where you completely lose it. You show him your bum while insulting your mother and applauding at the same time. That means you're out for 11 matches. So uh, it's only in lower levels at the moment. But I, I do think something uh, something really has to happen because clearly the uh, the umpire can make mistakes. Well, not really allowed to, but they're only human as well. They have emotions. And, and this really needs to be solved. I... I, I, I have not witnessed most of those things. Well, I've, I've witnessed a lot of the insults and such, but showing them the bums, I don't think I've ever seen. I didn't even realize I was on the list of things that needed to be, to be punished. But tell me, let's talk about some of the most classic examples of, of athletes insulting referees. I mean, who's, who are the naughtiest out there? Well, I tell you, it's often the high profile that clearly hit the public. And we saw recently, didn't we? We saw Gigi Buffon, who plays for Juventus. Now, they were in the later levels of the Champions League match, and he lost it. Uh, a penalty was given away. He didn't agree. And all 10 players surrounded the referee, and he was given a red card. The challenge here is a god in Italy. Everyone loves him, but it's not giving a good example, which is absolutely horrendous. Then we saw another example about the inconsistencies uh, in this sport. We saw Lionel Messi, uh, a great god, one of the best players in the world, playing for Argentina last year. He insulted a linesman. He was sent to the, He was sent by FIFA. They said, well, four-match ban, which is automatic there, 
there. And then what happens? The Argentina said, well, no, you can't really do that. He has some important games coming up. And so FIFA rescinded. And they said, no, OK, you can get away with it this time. So, so my, my pain here is it's not fair. Uh, you know, you need to have a set of rules. And I think you certainly have to have the discipline. And in other sports, they manage to do it. But in football, I think clearly it's the most high profile and clearly it's the most high pressure. But I do think the referee personally should be given a lot more authority. Yeah, I, I have to say I agree with you. That doesn't sound very, very fair at all, to be honest. Now, what about other sports? I mean, let's take tennis or, or rugby or basketball. I think basketball is also pretty brutal, no? Basketball is all about being good. The problem with basketball is an indoor arena. There's microphones everywhere. Every single slur can be picked up. We all remember a couple of years ago when Kobe Bryant was at his absolute prime. He uh, he was sent to the sideline and he made a homophobic slur against uh, a referee. Of course, he apologized and said he was out of contact, not proved later. But he was fined $100,000 for doing that. Moving across to tennis, clearly we had the one. The wonderful example in 2009 of Serena Williams losing it completely and talking down to a lineswoman. She's actually fined 82,000 US dollars there and to be moved to said, if you do it again, you won't be able to play next year. I suppose the classic example is, is uh, also in the in the tennis is McEnroe, John McEnroe. Remember 1981? You cannot be serious. Now, he was fined $6,000 for that, fined oh. 20 times in his career and in actual fact, $69,000 in his whole life. And if you've got a second, moving on to rugby, they know what you're doing. Only the captain there can talk to the actual referee, and the referee, if you're rude to him, you get sent off. So rugby knows what they're doing. Any back talk as well, well, 10 we yards back. <laughs> Sorry, Matt, we're also going to have to, uh, we're going to have to cut end this. Thank you so much. It was very informative. Thanks for joining us. And we are also out of time here on the Swiss Pulse. That's it for us here tonight on the Executive Talk. Remember, don't forget, if there's something that you have missed tonight you'd like to rewatch, or if you simply want to check in and see what we've been up to, cnnmoney.ch is the place to go. I'm Ana Maria Montero. Thank you so much for watching, and have a wonderful night. Welcome to the CNN Money Switzerland weekend weather, starting with Saturday. And here are the comfort indexes for the Swiss cities. Let's have a look for Saturday in Europe. the comfort indexes for some cities. Let's go to Sunday in Switzerland. And here are the comfort indexes. Discover the more attractive cities based on the weather. CNN Money Switzerland brings you the content you need whenever you need it. Get the latest Swiss business and financial information on TV or on the go through our website, cnnmoney.ch, or through your favorite social media. The best Swiss business news, whenever and wherever you need it. Only from CNN Money Switzerland.
How do you turn your idea into a successful business in Switzerland? If you want to develop your business, have individual mentoring and coaching, optimize your business model, develop a marketing strategy, acquire new skills, learn how to network. Romandie Formation, business opportunities anywhere. Excuse me, miss, you dropped this. No, it's just a penny. Just a penny? Just a penny? It all begins with the humble penny. Whether writing your first check or cashing big checks. To those at the top, making their mark, closing deals round the clock. On Quest Means Business, we know every penny has power. And it's not how many you have. It's what you do with them that counts. That's the marvel of money. Quest means business. What a profitable hour. CNN Money Switzerland is designed to flow through information. Our network provides a unique take on live, worldwide financial news. We are not your common news outlet. Instead, we act as a global catalyst of interconnected information. Our live studio provides you with a detailed and sharp analysis, predicting what is yet to come. From the heart of Europe, Watch CNN Money Switzerland. It's 9 a.m. here in New York. I'm Maggie Lake, live at the New York Stock Exchange. Coming up this hour... I'll get up and leave. Donald Trump warns he will walk out of the North Korean talks if they don't go well. Prime number, Amazon says 100 million paying customers are now signed up to its Prime service. And a new home for the fearless girl. We will reveal where Wall Street's iconic statue is going next. <laughs> 